the Thinking Tackle Podcast. Welcome to the Thinking Tackle Podcast. And today we're joined by a man who is perhaps best known for his detailed scientific knowledge of our quarry. But this is a man who has caught some of the finest carp that the UK has ever produced. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the fishing archive of Mr. Carp, Simon Scott. So I thank you very much for, for joining us in the studio today. That's um, my pleasure. Coming up from the deep south, <laughs> as you are. <laughs> yes. Um, how's life? It's really good. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, it's very good. Thanks for inviting me. And for, before we get started, I'd like to congratulate you on your new uh, position as host. Thank you. Um, Couldn't have been given to a better person. Oh, you're going to make me blush. No pressure. <laughs> no. <laughs> doesn't mean I'm going to be nice to you, though. Hopefully you'll yeah. ask me really nice questions <laughs> now. <laughs> um, I, I think we, we really should start with some fish chat because I know how, well, frankly, everything in your life is fish. Quite fishy. Yeah, yeah definitely. What What... What's been going on the farm then, Si? Okay, well, good question. The farm, it, we've had a, at this point a very, very dry summer and a very dry spring. So we are short of water and we've got some ponds that are very low. Um, fortunately, because we have aeration systems in the ponds, we're okay at the moment, but we'd quite like a bit of rain. I mean, the price of everything now to run a farm must be like be giving you sleepless nights. Yeah, the, the cost of the running the aerators. It's a difficult balancing act because the aeration systems not only do they directly put oxygen into the water um by mixing air through the water column uh, but they they also turn the pond over so they take the staler water at the bottom and they turn the whole thing over and that helps maintain the algae blooms in the ponds and of course an algae bloom so that sort of greeny tinge or a browny tinge in the water obviously it varies you some ponds you get like a reddy tinge it varies from pond to pond even ponds that are side by side can be very different but that algae bloom is creating free oxygen. So you've got a balancing act between wanting the aeration on enough just to keep those blooms ticking over and keep the pond healthy. And also there's the life support element of the aeration systems. Um, so one of the jobs the boys do regularly, um, you know, once or twice a week, depending on the ponds, is check the oxygen and check the, check the ammonia. So we've got to keep a close eye on water chemistry at this point. In the yeah. Year. And and I think, although you've got guys working for you now, you know, Martin, I think, runs the farm largely, doesn't he? Martin he and does. Dan, yeah. yeah. Um, you're not the kind of dad that can just switch off from worrying about your... Well, well, yeah, well, fish. <laughs> fish, yeah, it's sort of in you, I guess, as a fish yeah. person. But at, I imagine at night you'll wake up and be like, oh. Yeah, but the lads, I'm pretty confident the lads know what they're doing, so... Um, yeah. I don't think you're the best delegator, so I've got a <laughs> sense that, you're, that you would drive to the farm if you felt like. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm happy to go to the farm if there's yeah. a problem. Yeah, um, and I think it's going to. It's worth pointing out now that we are going to talk a little bit about what's just happened, despite the fact this podcast is going to go out probably late August, September time. We have just come through what is set to be quite a regular thing, I think, in summers yeah. to come, where we get this super, super hot periods. Uh, does that give you sleepless nights as a fish farmer? Yeah, yes, it does because things go wrong much quicker at higher temperatures. So, you know, to put this into context, what you just said, we, I was in Spain. I left Spain where it was forty degrees, and when I landed in the UK, I landed in at forty-one. You know, so so to have temperatures in the forties in the UK is exceptionally hot. And that has um, knock-on effects on the water chemistry in the ponds. It has a knock-on effect on the fish's uh, metabolism, their oxygen requirement. Um, and things go wrong very quickly at very high temperatures like that. Plus the fact that the fish live in the water. And with the you know the lack of rainfall and the very high temperatures, water levels are dropping. So you're, you're trying to grow fish in a smaller and smaller space. Mm. Um, so. and, and, and waste products become an issue the smaller the yeah. space the warmer the water the more toxic the ammonia becomes right. so I, I was on the phone to someone the other day and and um i think he might have quoted you to me about carp actually preferring to the hotter you they know, love it warm so yeah. so why are we worried well we're not worried at 27 28 degrees but 40 is a way beyond that isn't it yeah um and also you know our our lakes are shallow, you know, that problems become more exaggerated in shallow, shallow water. So, uh, no, yes, you're right. A, a, a carp, given the choice, would like to sit at sort of 27 or 28 degrees centigrade. Um, you know, so if you get the odd day when the, when it might be 34 or 35, they'll find themselves a nice 
corner. They'll sit in a weed bed, which is photosynthesizing. And a lot of the guys watching or listening to this will have seen this. Middle of the afternoon in the summer, they're sitting in the weed and that weed bed is literally fizzing with tiny bubbles. Every one of those bubbles is a little bubble of oxygen. That's about as easy as it gets for a car. But of course at nighttime, very warm water holds very little oxygen and the plants are sucking it up for respiration. So it becomes a tricky environment. You see, I, I often think about this when I'm fishing because like a lot of people, I suppose, much of my fishing is done at night. And actually it seems like probably in the last few years, I've had very few bites at night, but you know, that could be, that's likely to be specific to the lake. But when I'm looking for areas to fish, I often think about that, the respiration mm. of a weed bed at night. Yeah. But you get bites at night next to weed. Yes, you do. But <laughs> no two ponds are the same. No two environments are the same. And what could be happening in pond A might mm. be totally different in pond B. At, at night time, if the oxygen is low, and then you've got plants respiring, sucking that oxygen down yet further, that is likely to turn the fish off. So they're gonna feed maybe at first light. But I'd have mentioned it in the previous podcast, you've also got the payoff, for example, bloodworm. If the oxygen's low, they come closer to the surface of the mm -hmm. silt layer. And so they're more readily find up, you know, fish can find them and harvest them more easily. Yeah. So I think for any angler, you need to, you need to think, right, what is happening in my lake? Now I know the theory, is that the weed bed is lots of oxygen in the day and then at night it might not be but are the fish hanging around in that area are they there 24 hours a day or are they moving and it's seeing those patterns mm. particularly as we come into the autumn which is the time this podcast is like to go out the water temperatures are coming down the days are getting shorter and shorter and then you know it's it makes more sense for a carp to switch to night feeding and then anyway i i do wonder how much you put into your own fishing as well so si. is it is it instinct now the, the stuff you've learned does has that become ingrained to the degree you don't have to think about it you're just thinking in those terms or or do you think uh, the, it's been hot you know uh, there's not a lot of oxygen going on i'm going to fish away from that weed bed yeah i i think in my own i mean the, the one thing i learned in my own fishing a long time ago is go where you see the fish try and try and catch one now rather than plan 12 hours in advance now if you'd baited a spot up regularly then obviously you've got something to drop onto but if if you turn up at the lake it, it, you want to catch the quickest carp you can you don't have to why wait until four o'clock tomorrow morning when you can catch one at four o'clock this afternoon so you know get one get one and then move i yeah. guess yeah i mean we're going to talk a, a fair bit of fishing today um but i think let's just concentrate for the minute on on considerations for the early autumn right um give us a few things a few ideas of what people can put into their fishing side for for those what's happening in the lakes uh, broad brush strokes okay. um around early september. broadly speaking early september come well in september going on to october the temperatures hope possibly should be coming back down again so as the water temperature is cooling the water can hold more oxygen because it can hold more oxygen, it becomes more comfortable for the fish to feed at night. So what might in August, July and August have been a tricky for them at night because their metabolism is very high uh, and um, the water wasn't holding a lot of oxygen. As their metabolism cools down a tiny bit, as the water cools down a bit, they need less oxygen, plus the fact the water holds more oxygen. So they might well switch to night feeding. Plus the fact that at that point in the year, they, they, there's that build up towards next spring spawning going on. So that would be the time in the year, definitely, that I would like to apply a bit of bait to areas. You know, keep Whether it's 20 boilies, it doesn't have to be 10 kilos a day, but if you can trickle bait in on spots regularly, then that's the time to be doing that, I think. I, I hear a lot of recycled ideas in fishing mm. these days. You know, <laughs> because we've got, let's face it, we've got 60 years of sort of the modern era now yeah. to draw on things do seem to change um i wonder how much of the stuff that we constantly repeat to ourselves is true you know like fish following the wind for instance or, or autumn being a good time for a big feed mm. like it feels like anecdotal evidence is that that doesn't happen so much mm. now well i can guarantee you carp still follow the wind yep. i see it at the fish farm all the time on particularly on our, we've got a couple of big production ponds that are 300 meters long. If the wind's hammering down one way, they'll all be on the wind and the wind switches around mid-afternoon, They the whole lot, a thousand carp will move up the other end. So carp still follow the wind. 
they might not follow the wind on the pit. You're fishing because there's other factors coming in like oxygen, like water temperature, like angling pressure. But that that, that sort of ingrained uh, instinct of a carp to follow the wind is definitely still there. Yeah. yeah. What, what um, in terms of like evolutionary fitness, what does purpose does that serve? Is it simply where the oxygenated water oxygen is? Oxygen and warmth, I right. think, yeah. Um, I'm not so sure about the food thing. When I see fish that have followed the wind, on the farm, they've, they've just ended up under the, where the wind blows, it, the weed collects and they sit up under that scum. And effectively that scum layer isn't reflective. Like, like the, the surface of the water in the lake is a reflective surface. We know that from our own fishing on a bright day, you can't look at it. That, so that means a lot of the sun's rays are bouncing off, but when it gets a, a, like a blanket of weed on it, it doesn't reflect the same. So that surface layer is super heating. Now I was going back to what I said, can't like it warm. If you're a big old carp and you've had a, tr a good old feed up in the in the early morning, the sun comes out, there's a breeze, it blows that scummy weed into a, into a bay. That is the perfect spot for a carp to sit. It's got a nice solar blanket on his head. He can sit there, his eyes are covered up, they're nicely shaded, and he can just sit there and digest and enjoy the warmth. Like, and how important is that, you know, in terms of how much they can eat and therefore how likely we would be to catch them over bait, for instance, uh, you know, how much is their metabolism and, and the sun's warming effect on the metabolism? How, how important is that? Sorry. That is important. Yeah, it's definitely important. But, you know, that, that that's the behavior they'll choose to do. Whether they then go and feed on a big bed of bait or not, it depends on other factors like mm. the water chemistry. Is there auction available? Mm. But the one thing I see over and over, a carp love to sit under a scummy corner. If you get a, a big pit and there's a big bay that's got there is a there. willow fluff or yeah. leaves on it, they're in there under yeah. that. So they love it. I think... I've heard it said, I don't know how true this is, that, that Hutchie was prob was the first to really make that link between the wind mm. and carp. Um, and it's, and you know, it's, it's nice that you've sort of affirmed that link because yeah. quite often I've been on the end of wind and there aren't any carp there. No, um, but from an angling point of view, if the wind starts blowing, follow it give it 24 hours and then go up the other end because they might be on the back of it for another, if it's a cooling breeze, for example. What, what do you feel about carp's ability to detect a change of the weather before we do? Oh, uh, uh, in a split second. Right. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. We, we live in a world of electric lights, heaters, mobile phones. You don't have to think about anything. The carp live in a very dynamic world where oxygen's changing on a minute by minute basis, water temperatures are changing on a minute by minute basis, pressure's changing. So they're they're acutely tuned into their environment. So mm. they will they will get up and move about much much quicker than we do, mm. definitely. Um, now you're in the middle of uh, of what seems like a summer off, right? Fishing. Um, gro <laughs> you're growing vegetables <laughs> instead. Um, <laughs> We should say, I think, thanks, you know, for, from everyone here, I'm sure, you know, if you haven't had it already, then massive congratulations on the capture of the Burfield Common. Thank you. <laughs> one of the, always one of the standout moments of any year that it's look, you know, oh. someone's lucky enough to catch it. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to talk about that because hopefully you're going to, but I will at some stage do a slideshow. Yes. But yeah, but the, I was going to try and pin you down to this autumn, but that sounds like you were no, quite the, evasive on but that. The, the 29th of July will live with me. Those were, yeah, just uh, puts emotions straight in my throat just thinking about it. Yeah. What, what, when you look in the landing net and that fish is there, mm. um, yeah. you could hang your rods up. <laughs> well, uh, well, this is the worry side. How do you follow the Burfield Common? How, you know, how, do you, how do you feel about your fishing at the moment? Well, I'm, I'm very relaxed. We've had a tricky year from a family point of view with one thing and another. Mm. And it just, I haven't really had, I've been busy and uh, busy tending my vegetable patch and yeah. being around at home. And, and how important is it? Because when you were in the swing of that campaign, uh, you know, we've spoken uh, and I know how much effort you put in <laughs> backwards and forwards to Reading. How important is is that rhythm and that kind of almost you don't have to think about it you're just in the routine yeah I, I, yeah it, it it is very important to those captures and anybody that's chasing one specific fish will know you you just you have to you have to go down that road and I, I remember people you know contacts friends saying um, Ben down in the West Country saying oh, you know how about we hook up for a go have a social three days fishing it's like I I can't do that. And I've, I've got to go to Perfield mm. because if you don't, that's the maybe a chance gone. You just, mm. I mean, Tom Stokes said the same thing. You, you just, you just got to keep going. You've got to keep going. Uh, you, you know, with all due respect to Tom, he was in probably a better position in life yeah. to do that than you were. You life know, does get away. In a family, it gets in the way a tiny bit. <laughs> yeah, but, but I've got a very lovely, very patient wife. 
Yeah. And um, yeah. And friends who were happy not to see you as much. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just know I didn't ring them very much. <laughs> um, but like I say, you know, as much like every fiber in my body wants to ask you more about the Burfield, but you know, we're going to respect the oh, fact gonna, that you're going to do. I promise. You better do the slideshow now. I promise. You know? I promise. I'm touching wood, but I promise I will get around to it. Yeah. And if you don't, you've got to come back on. I'll come just, back and do, yeah. I'll do one of these. Oh no. Um, I said you that. said it live on air now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll get the slideshow done. I think we should do it I anyway. like this. A, a slideshow, Rich, is just a... It's retro, mate. I, I know it's old school, but just doing the Raysbury slideshow way back, in a, in a hall with 200 people in the dark with those images up on the wall it's a certain magic to that mm. i might i still can't talk about it either i could burst into tears every time i think about the comments really <laughs> yeah. oh, we don't want necessarily no. No, tears on camera now yeah. it's no good <laughs> let <laughs> me do that in a, toby, toby saying yes do it no, let me do that in a dark <laughs> let me do that in a dark hall where people can't see me but, sobbing but the fact you're still so emotional about it is it is it the context of the year that you've had uh, as yeah, well it's just the fish you just you fish forever for that. You, I mean, I mean you are, have, haven't yeah, you? More, yeah. I know that it was like a probably a 15 year break in the middle of yeah, your association but, uh, but, with Burfield. But. Yeah. It's the most unpredictable, odd character of a carp ever. <laughs> How much um, in the interim between your first, in the 90s, you were there first, weren't you? Yeah, 96, 97. So the Burfield Common had, had it, did Piers, when, when did Piers, yeah, had, I, it, had it even been caught at yeah, that stage? Yeah, right? had. Uh, Piers called it when I was there actually fishing. Yeah. Um, I think it was 30 something pounds, wasn't 39, it? 39, yeah. yeah. So, um, But uh, it had then been a huge chunk of time in between when you weren't there. How often would you think about that fish in the interim? No, not not loads, but as time passed and I'd obviously went to Raysbury and caught those fish, then you sort of, you could see it sort of coming back together yeah. again. You're thinking, oh no. It's Just mad to think you went to Burfield. Then you caught the, those history fish from Raysbury, which seemed like they were in their own era oh, in and of themselves. That and then came back magical. and the Burfield common was still alive. Well, not only alive, it, but it had gone from being a, a big common to like a super select, uh, just yeah. the, the, the carp, now, um, <laughs> the carp to catch. Obviously, the, the we talked a little bit about the the things that, they, that this demands. I mean, I don't, I don't, how, I don't know how many miles you did. It would have been a lot, though, to Reading back. Even, no. Uh, squat, <laughs> don't ever think about no, it. No. But, I know how many times I went, give or take. Yeah, I have I've, I've kept sort of a few notes, and I know how much bait I used and those sorts of details and how many, is, how many cam, you know, Kamakura hooks I used. Yeah. <laughs> all those things. Well, you caught quite a lot of carp, didn't you, as oh, well? Oh, I caught so. some amazing carp. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing place. Um, um, but during that, during that time, did you... I mean, how do you how do you get into the zone side? Was it tunnel vision? Was there an ever doubt that, that it might happen? Um, like a massive, massive doubt, Rich. You, because of the way that place is, and because of the, the the sort of the carnage of humanity that happens around it, you know, it's this most beautiful blue oasis dotted with green, lush islands, and just all the way around is just the carnage of humanity really mm -hmm. burnt out it's cars, like the wild west isn't it i mean fly tipping yeah, just yeah. carnage i mean there was a bit of that going on at it, raysbury but burfield was like pimped up you've only fished <laughs> waters with <laughs> yeah like, those kind of issues yeah. I mean, socio-economic issues yeah so yeah it, you 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 have to get i, I became increasingly tunnel vision mm -hmm. and you know as as opportunities line themselves out i thought well i have no choice now i have to uh, it will be me or the fish Right. So, uh, so you were, you were willing to be there in ten years' time? Yeah, yeah. Just because I because of the way the situation is lined up, I thought I, I just have to keep going. And and how much of that was to do with the with the prestige of that carp and the fact that it probably is the last of that? Well, it's like the la the last of that generation yeah. because of otter predation, because of uh, commercialization. You know, to, to go and turn up at a hundred and twenty acre gravel pit like Raysbury and and not find anglers there. Or you know, when I went, I remember going around Raysbury and they were just there was hardly a soul there. Mm. And that was when Mary was the British record. You know, so it, that, that sort of place is, is harder to come by now, definitely. And, and we, you know, in our own small ways, we've all sort of played a part in what has been, as yeah. you said, the commercialization of yeah. the car. Oh, machine. definitely, I mean, yeah. You, the, the, the VS Fisheries thing seems to have been a huge success and, and grown a lot thanks to the hard work that you and Viv put in. Um, how It's a question I asked to, um, to Matt from Embryo, how much responsibility do you feel in terms of the fact that you're leaving a lot of... Oh, massively. Yeah, yeah. I, and when, you know, when you're in that hatchery stirring that bowl of eggs, there's, there's a, 
well, I say you're in that. Sue might be staring the bowl of eggs, and I'm normally running around pretending to be busy. Um, but Sue and Sue is very good at stirring two bowls simultaneously. While I seem. And why do they use it? Like I've seen it done with a feather. So what? Well, we don't use feathers anymore. No, I, well, I use a plastic spoon normally. But no. why a feather? Uh, just because that's sort of the traditional way to stir it. It's very delicate on on the eggs. But <laughs> particular type, like swan, a heron. Or goose? Heron, heron is meant to be that, that, the, that, the feather the of choice. Irony. Yeah, or a kingfisher, but they're a bit small. You get eggs on your fingertips. Um, kingfisher feather. That's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> it's a definitely a lie. I love a kingfisher. Um, but uh, yeah, when Sue is stirring those bowls, you, you're you know you think well you've you're, you're You've produced a batch of uh, eggs there that will be leaving the farm in two, three, four, five, six, seven years time. And then they're going on to become hopefully monsters of the cart fishing scene in the next 10, 20 years. Mm. It's a, yeah. But I love that. I love the fact that you're you're putting something back into a sport that I, I you know, I, I lived and breathed for. I'm obviously I'm slightly through it now because of what happened last July, but I still love it, you know. I still think about it a bit, and I still look at pictures of big carp and mm. flick through books and whatever. But I think the problem that many of us face, and, and I'm not putting myself in 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 any particular group here, but because you fished, you been you were fishing seriously before before me. But all of us who were influenced by a certain group of anglers mm. and a certain type of fishing, like your raised breeze, now can't find that anywhere. Oh, it's very difficult. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Um, even Burfield, there are far more fish in Burfield than yeah, than uh, and and lots of anglers. It's, bu it's busy and it's you know it's most lakes are full of you know in some cases your carp and <laughs> and and we're, we're producing a scene that feels no longer suitable mm. for for me, but it is suitable for an awful lot of the, yeah, the majority of people. Most people which is want great. to get their string pulled, don't they? Of course, it's it. There's a certain mindset to go. I I'm, I might not catch a carp this whole year. I mean, it happened. Are... that was a bit of you, though, right? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Going back, but that used to make me ultra determined to try and catch them. You know, I don't yeah. believe that you want to go and catch nine carp in a, in a trip, though, either. No, that's quite busy. <laughs> yeah, let's say nine. No, I mean, I didn't... one or two is yeah. fine for me normally. <laughs> Having said that, you did catch a lot of carp out of birth. I didn't did. You? Yeah, was it over a hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the people who are not. That many people have caught over a hundred carp from Burfield. Are you in quite a select group there? I think. I guess so. Oz, yeah. Terry, yourself. I'm sure there yeah. are others. Um, I, I can't think off the top of Tom my head. Tom Stokes, definitely. Stokes, if, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, I think that seems these days to be the mark of a good campaign on there that you mm. have actually, you know, and all those guys caught the common. Mm. They caught uh, Laney. Yeah. Almost certainly caught a lot. Yeah. I'm not sure he caught it quite quick. He so quite it might did, not been a hundred. He was catching he was on a lot. His way, wasn't he? He was probably. catching a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so were you in touch with the lake during that time? So Laney was on there. You you hadn't even had the no, inkling I'd, to go back. No, that was kind of in the period when I was off doing other stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, less. And then, yes, yeah, to say, the roads kind of kept heading back. Yeah, it because it, I've said it elsewhere, but it feels to me like the Burfield Common is the one fish that unites the scene now. Um, it comes out and everyone's interested, I even just, for a day. But Rich, you could not have prepared me, and I try not to burst into tears again, mm. but the 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 emotional outpouring from people was just i i couldn't well i think part of that was i you. couldn't believe my phone yeah i mean that i just had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages from people that i haven't seen for 30 years i had text messages from i must have had 60 or 70 text messages from ex-students just saying just heard the news amazing congratulations i yeah. i got I, I, it took me days to com I couldn't comp compute that for what, days and days. What were you like um, <laughs> when you got home? Like, how did how did Sue find your? Mood? Sue said, "Are we going on holiday <laughs> now?" <laughs> she had. I've got a photograph which will be in the slideshow, but she's got a pair of sunglasses on. She's like, "Holiday?" Yeah, at the door. She's yeah, literally. Door are we going <laughs> now? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And did you go on holiday? Uh, yes. Where did you go? Oh, uh, <laughs> somewhere. Lime Regis. Oh. <laughs> You took the camper van and went to Lyme Regis. We, went, we took the van to Lyme Regis, <laughs> what, right, what She's would, a very lucky lady. <laughs> what would you need to catch to justify Barbados? Then? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't exist, does no. it? <laughs> um, Listen, sometimes the most basic holidays where you don't have to go miles and you can just touch back to your partner, whatever, that's mm. the best. <laughs> mm. Well said. And, and Sue deserved it. Yeah. Um, because you'd had to do probably go over and above what you'd done in the previous yeah yeah i, I think know, i like, think she got quite bored of uh, when was the last time you put in as much effort as that oh uh, uh, well, Ma breed? malins yeah chasing yeah. malins definitely yeah, yeah.
Um, so we are we're going to have a slideshow to look forward to. Yeah, I've been um, to the raise we want. I'm working on it, Rich. Right. Yeah. I, I feel you, like I, this I is know the, you've not done very much so I've done so. a bit <laughs> I, I, if I'm really honest rich that the problem that is, the problem I'm having is the tech because previously all my slideshows have been done on little transparencies and a lot of the guys listening or watching this won't have a clue what I'm talking about but back in the day was actual slides it, it, they were the actually yeah. tiny little transparencies a little picture in a in a little plastic mount that you drop into a slide projector and it would project up onto the wall that's the era of slideshows I come from. So mm. having to try and get my head around uh, Keynote on an Apple Mac has, has been a whole world of trouble. <laughs> um, yes, it's yeah. taken me a while and I can't, I probably need some expert advice. But and what about in terms of condensing what is going to be a huge story, like many, many more fish than Raysbury. So you didn't have those yeah, we'll have to natural do. story leading up to a capture. You probably caught loads. So how do you, how do you get your head around making that, a good narrative out of that that's the problem yeah yeah <laughs> yeah pictures you never it's interesting that you never take enough pictures of the lake when you're there mm. the swims when you're there mm. the trees when you're there the wildlife when you're there so filling in a few of those gaps no it, it raises the obvious question that i've i've put to you before um and you were probably sick of batting away but um <laughs> on, even banks he's come out and done a book sorry si. so no. you're doing all of the stuff around a book oh, gee. aren't you we covered this doing in all the, the first, hard work the first podcast i discussed dyslexia that hasn't gone away no but there are ways there, there are ways you can do it <laughs> the aren't thought of doing a book i just <sighs> <laughs> i might do no, a book just say it, no it, no yes no I, I i can't see me ever doing a book no. Because I loved your, cha you know, your, your chapter in the Forgotten Chapters was amazing. I, I, I do like writing stuff, uh, but I don't know. There's a lot. Imagine if you could have 10 of those quality of chapters. Yeah, I could. Uh, if I did a, yeah, if. <laughs> but this is what I mean. You're never, you're always equivocal about this, which is why there's, there's I asked the question. There's always a little bit. You're not the it. first person. A few people, including the guy you just mentioned, went, right, you've called it now. Now you have to do a book. Yeah. And I'd be going, oh, to a slideshow. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, God. I mean, you probably should have said back in the day something like, Neither. If Banksy ever does a book, then I'll do one. But thinking that, that there's no way <laughs> that, safe, that was good. safe ground. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Tom said to me, oh, you, now you've called it, you have to do a book. I was like, oh, no. Well, anyway, we'll park that till but, the next uh, time. Yeah. I, li I do like the written stuff. It takes me a long time to write. I remember write, you know, doing a Carpology article, 2,000 words, and those take a long time. It doesn't flow out but of me All of well. this stuff that I think the reason I ask is all of this stuff that you, like your articles, mm. uh, like your slideshows, that you're clearly putting a lot of effort into, you know, mm. you're putting as much effort into that as you could be to a chapter. Yeah, instance. yeah. Although how you'd ever write the, I mean, the Burfield chapter would be like three chapters long, presumably, because yeah. of the fish, or do you condense that? I mean... It's tough. It's tough to read. There's so many books, Rich. There, there are so and many it's books. The, I know it's the wrong time. Yeah, but but a good book should still yeah yeah be done well, definitely. definitely. Um, you know, and I feel like the quality of stuff that you've done in the past. Uh, you know, I would read it, and I'm oh, sure. Bless you. Um, oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you. we could rally the support of the Think and Tackle podcast listeners. <laughs> okay, all four of them, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Toby's in that list as well. So there's everyone, only another two, we'll which would be Sue way. and me. <laughs> put it this way: if everyone who watches this one bought a book, you'd be sweet. We'd be yeah. all right, yeah. Okay. Um, but we, I do want to talk a bit of a bit of fishing. So I yeah. know that uh, we're going to come back onto the, the biology stuff and the farm stuff as well, because uh, there's always an appetite for that. Yeah, yeah, but. Um, we haven't done loads of fishing stuff with you over the years, largely because, uh, and you're not alone in this, that there's quite a lot you can't talk about. I know that. And we, mm. we've got to respect that. And we should respect that because, you know, several of us are in the same boat. And yeah. So to, to, to put that into context, what you're meaning there, Rich, is that we, I fish waters that mm. are no publicity. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Which you choose to do. Yeah. Uh, because actually, uh, and it's been like this since I first met you, um, you know, 17 years ago or so, you, you know, you do the work because people ask you to do the work. Mm. Not, you know, you're not choosing your waters because they fit with your, um, you know, your kind of work in the industry. If you like, mm. you're choosing waters because you want to fish them. And if someone comes and says, "Sai, can we do an article on X, Y, Z?" You're going to do it because mm. you're that kind of guy. You say you'll say yes mm. usually. Mm. Um, but it doesn't mean you pick the. <laughs> that doesn't mean you pick the waters to suit that, does it? No, no. I fish the place that I want to fish. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, do you have to be as hard nosed about it as that in order to sort of get the joy out of the bits of fishing that, is, that are yours? Yeah, I mean, the sort of filming fishing, which I've done obviously with Mark uh, for Thinking Tackle um, and and 
the article stuff is always different. It's always that's like that's work. That's never proper. Fishing but you wing. choose to do it. I mean, that, yeah, I, bit, I enjoy doing that. Yeah, it's good, good fun. I, I was, I remember the masterclass that we shot at Hunt's Corner. Oh. Um, exciting. Where you got, I think we we were doing a bit to camera, or you were with Ali. Yeah, remember, I remember it camera. so well. Yeah. I clipped the bobbin on. I'd, I'd so basically I was using like a, a casting a marker float rod from under the snags. Well, not snags. Big. There were massive yeah, overhang overhanging trees. Yeah. yeah, snags is the wrong word, but big overhanging trees, which meant meant it was very difficult to cast the bait tight. So I went in, waded in, flicked a marker float out cast over it hooked it up reeled it across da, 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 set it all up it's very long winded and i remember ali thinking what are you doing got it all set up clipped the bobbin on it nice and tight and literally as ali sat there gushing away the, the bobbin just dropped off and the line went slack and that was that great and you can go and check it out because you know if you're on youtube watching this and you know yeah head over and have a look because it is uh, <laughs> we always remember we always remember the blue salmon rod that you were using at the time as well <laughs> that's right. Daiwa, that, uh, i think it was six piece because at the time they didn't have a stalking rod. i'm sure they do now but they didn't and that was what you had to use and uh it worked it but did if you've ever walked onto hunt's corner um people will, will know the margin you were talking about the first corner that you come to yeah, on that right if you side. go straight on it looks tasty doesn't it yeah well, they were under there, weren't they? And you yeah. could stand in amongst those trees and you'd have fish feeding all along that gravel. And of course, you can't get to them. Now, obviously, that's the kind of, that's become your thing, uh, largely because that's the sort of fishing that you mm. like to do, the, the, the kind of creeping about, yeah. ultra in the edge stuff. Has it ever bothered you that you're then seen as that angler? Not, I, no, it never bothers me at all. And, and uh, I can't cast for toffee. Uh, so um, I'm the most inaccurate caster. So <laughs> it suits me down to the ground, really. Why, why have you never developed that side of your game? What, casting? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, I, do, I can, I mean, I do fish out in the pond, but uh, yeah. Well, Burfield. Yeah. Well, that, you know, you caught the most sought after cast uh, yeah, in the country that, out in the Using pond. a bait boat. You right. might as well lower it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't count. I used a bait boat. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy. To, I like 60, 70. I mean, I went to Gigantica in the autumn and fished at 28 routes. You know, and um, I mean, that's I, a long way. I've from... still got a tennis elbow now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I just, I, I'm not a long range caster. Now, I did have a day with Terry Edmonds, though, at yes. the farm, which with Mark and uh, Mark Calcavetti. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is something to behold. I would highly recommend that everybody book up a day with Terry Edmonds. Not only is he an absolutely lovely, lovely, charming chap, but he takes your rod and, and he, sort of left-handed while he's talking to you looking the other way casts it about 200 yards so you can't say it's my rod and the reel no. he did it he did he took mark's rod and did that he cast it left-handed he then cast on his knees and hit the clip at about 160 yards yeah. or something. i mean just and he makes it look so so easy and then you got the rod and uh, i managed to cast nearly 10 wraps yeah, I was quite no, pleased. you did. <laughs> See, because you're. I got to twenty eight wraps. Not think. only are you quite a competitive guy, you're also like physically very capable, aren't you? So you must have like you know like you run. Yeah. You, I don't know if you still do. You still yeah, run? yeah, still, yeah, still you know, doing you keep stuff. Fit yeah. and, and strong from. The, you yeah, know, you need to be as a fish farmer. So maybe. you must have been thinking, I'm. I've got all the bits. Uh, I've got to put it together somehow. Uh, but I knew uh, Mark and Mark just le left me for dead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Cav can. Why? Cav can really cast. He he cast he's it a, a long he's way. He's quite a unit. Though, he's quite he? so. a, a strong. Well, I yeah. Think. Unit makes him sound large. No. Um, um, and Mark Bryant can cast. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah I did get further. But anyway, Terry Edmonds Day highly recommended. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Nice guy. Well, Great experience. Let's hope you get to use it. Yeah. Well, I, I did use it in Gigantica. Yes. So, um, yeah. Was it just ahead of that trip? Yeah. So uh, yeah. Um. And um you, what did you? Sorry, Rich. Sorry. No, I just I didn't want to jump in there. So I right. found the um. The clip of uh, Scotty and Ali. Was oh, that... yeah, yeah. Let's have a look. Yes. Let's, let's... Is it, am I right Fire in saying? It... Oh, well done. Was it f five facts that will catch you more carbs? Does that ring any bells? Is that the right one? Ooh. Try it. Should we have a quick look? Go on. Let's know. see. So let's have a look. If it's wrong, it could be quite funny anyway. Oh, yeah, that's look at it. that. Yeah, yeah. Look at <laughs> that. We've done well. Look at those two young dudes. That was worth interrupting. Right there, Scotty. Then. Get that bobbin on. <laughs> <laughs> Should we have a look? Yeah, let's have a little look. Right. I then. feel like I was in the swim for this, but I might not have been. The rod's still got the cellophane oh, on, look. Back in yeah. The mix. Um, indeed, mate. Um, indeed. Back in the mix. Yeah. Clip it oh, on. Joking. You're away. <laughs> you didn't even get the bobbin on. I didn't on. get the no. bobbin on. 
<laughs> I can't believe it, Ali. <laughs> I, did, I did say to you, this won't take long. You've Right, he's just put the rig back out the same way. I think he's even taken um, Ali by surprise. Under there. that margin. <laughs> and um, he was saying, he's, he's shown me it here in his little scientific gills for his code. <laughs> what he does, <laughs> doing like, like this, telling me there's oh, fish Ali. down there. And um, lo and behold, we're just about to start questioning Simon Scott and some of these wonderful social network questions that we've got off mm. our wonderful supporters and fans. Lovely if the world. sun's out, does it make the oxygen level higher? God, ben, Scott, you do look a bit younger there. I do. Um, I feel like 2018 wasn't that long this was. No. It, it went up in 2018. Yeah, it filmed a lot. Was it filmed a lot? Yeah. yeah. This has still got the flip flop. Have you? Um, do you remember when it was filmed? Then? Yeah. It was hot, mate. Rich was there, definitely. Rich yeah. was filming it. No, no, I wasn't. It, this is this is forty. Um, I was there. Uh, I think we were doing some floater stuff as well. Yeah, maybe right. you were in. Yeah, is it, Tobes. It was right, like twenty fourteen. Oh wow! Yeah. So quite a few years before it went out. Yeah. Can we see the fish? Yeah, the fish is coming up. <laughs> Sorry for everyone who's who's listening on the podcast. This is a this is a, a clip from what was the masterclass at the time. There you go. Going in the net. I think it was a. I don't remember it being a pretty one, Ty. I've got. I've got. I want to draw attention to the fact that I don't. They're think all it pretty. No. Well, I mean, you have beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Rich. Yeah. Helps when they're 40. We're both married. Helps. When, yeah. <laughs> Helps when they're like forty or fifty pound out of Burfield. Yeah. I think this is one of their distant cousins. <laughs> about to get caught. <laughs> oh my god. Run it forward, Tobes. Yeah, let's yeah, let's get the fish on. up and let's see. Oh, people. Oh, we're talking digestive enzymes. I don't know if it was oh, your alley. Uh, um, God, it's hanging on, Scott. Is <laughs> God, it fought <laughs> hard. <laughs> this is because I'm playing out on a ridiculous rod, and you're stuck under that tree for some reason. Like you can't now move. Um, <laughs> it does. It does. But. This is basically Scotty stuck on a tiny little bit of a root ball. Oh, Here we go. No, it's a little scaly one. My memory. Oh, go on, get it. Is that Ali on the net? Yeah, he's missed it. Oh, it's just good. Oh, Ali. I should have OMG. Um, come on, we've got to come this Oh, there it is. Go on, just trust me. Please. Uh, he's in the net. He's in. Um, there you go, two fish in two casts. I'm absolutely no. Do you know what I was wrong? It must have been a different one. A little one, bit of margin trickery can work its magic. Cracking great male. That's a lovely carp, to be fair. Look at the size of the scale. It's a great fish, actually. Though. Yes, I caught one. <laughs> I'd have been chuffed a bit for that because catching them for the camera is always extra precious. There you go. Well, sorry I interrupted you, Rich, but I thought it no, was no, I mean, that was yeah, TV gold, <laughs> don't be. I mean, that but it's something that you've actually, for some reason. Was it was it the lecturing what, that made you so at ease in terms of delivering? Um, I, gu I guess so. Yeah. yeah. When you've when you've talked to groups of twenty or thirty kid, you know, guys sat in a classroom, I think probably doing that is uh, yeah, it's okay. Do you miss sober. it? Um, I t I did. I showed some students around the farm about a month ago, and they were the most engaging group. They were quite a, a level three course. They weren't degree students or anything, right. but they were super super keen. And uh, yeah, it was it was really nice. They asked some great questions. And when we're in the hatchery, there's the grey tank in the hatchery that I used to have at the end of my bed, and uh, that some of the raspberry fish lived in when they were only sort of two pounders. Mm. And th I told them that story, and they were absolutely loved that. They were full of it. Do, so. do they know what raspberry is? Yeah, they do. Uh, they did do. they know what it was? Uh, I think they did. Yeah, and I, I spoke of you know the fact that the fish in there were forty pounders now, and they, I think they could see. I mean, it quite cool. That, that that is one of the interesting things. I've heard people say most people today don't know X, Y, or Z. Mm. You know, a lot of the young anglers are don't know what red mire is. Yeah, for instance. <laughs> yeah. Um, do they know Simon Scott because of Corder, as opposed to having caught Mary, for instance? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So yeah. they're more likely to have seen what we just watched. Yeah, probably. Than to have sought out your stuff in Forgotten Chapters, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's a really interesting period, isn't it? Because obviously, that the, there's like we like we mentioned with the. I'm not going to call it commercialization. It's more accessible, isn't it? Let's yeah, face it. Definitely. Carp fishing is extremely accessible now. Yeah, you can, if you're 15 or 16 year old and you want to catch a big fish, then a carp is the easiest route to go down, isn't it? And a 20 pound carp, which is a very, very, very common fish now, is for the average person, a massive fish. If you show somebody on, on Basildon High Street, a 20 pound carp, they'd be blown away by the size of it. It's a big fish, isn't it? Mm. And there are 20 pound carp all over the country. There are hundreds of thousands of them. So it's an accessible big fish that you can go and fish for. How do you feel about the fish that leave your farm? 
about the the fate that they then have like in terms of what fisheries they go to does it ever cross do, do you ever think about it uh, i used to a bit but i think it's a business and you have to you have to try and you know, but that doesn't you, mean but all you can do when you deliver fish is give the, some advice yeah. best your best advice and certainly when we take orders and viv tends to deal with the customers he speaks to a lot of customers and when viv is talking to the customers with hopefully we're trying to give them the best advice so their fisheries go on to prosper because it's very shallow for me to sell fish that aren't going to make it you want you want to see pictures of 30s and 40s and actually you do see that a lot you're now in that cycle of the business where you you uh, lots of the fish have gone out and yeah. now the size is extremely of four, lots of 40 pounders <laughs> attractive to people yeah so it's almost the best it must be the best time to 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 be in the business because uh for what 10 or 15 years how long has it been 10 years 15 years now, 15 yeah. years so for the, you know it would have taken a long time for those big fish to come through yeah now we're, once you go past that sort of 10 11 year mark there are 40 pounders and that number's built every autumn yeah, la you la the last last autumn last october there was viv was getting pictures of 40 pounders every single day which and, is great and do you ever tire of of him forwarding those on to you or no or no no it's, oh, it's good to see him no yeah. it's, it's good it's uh and do you remember what batch they were sometimes <laughs> 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 but i've had i had a guy this made me smile it was really nice it, this chap sent me a picture via instagram of a i think it was about a 23 pounder and he said do you remember this one mr scott and i looked at it i was like um i was thinking is it a fish i you know should i remember yeah. it and i said uh, i in the end i wrote back to said oh thank you great fish well done brilliant to catch such a lovely one um i don't actually remember it Wh where's it from and he said oh it was stocked seven years ago into one of our local waters it's 20 something mm. pounds now. <laughs> and I'm like, i don't remember that one i'm so sorry what what you do you find that kingfisher feather or heron feather to produce the bigger carp uh, uh heron really? plastic spoon <laughs> yeah. um but, but it must be lovely though nonetheless to see those fish come through and actually when you're producing because, because you work with different strains mm. that's that's the it seems to me that the creativity part of your job is at that stage mm. it's planning what crosses to do yeah um and that gives you that kind of outlet of yeah you know experimental stuff yeah. and mix it up a bit when you cross two fish uh, you must have an image in your head how often does that actually translate into what you then see it rarely right. <laughs> now i'd like to say every single time but it it doesn't always i mean you can you can plan some stuff uh so for example if you use uh, a rich has just thrown water at me at this point um so hopefully toby will come in Where's with a towel roll? i mean i've never been in a corner <laughs> podcast where this has happened before nor have I. This is all new. This would have never happened in it's, Simon it, Pitt's time. No. <laughs> Cheers, Si. Um, You're not actually the first person to have done it. Thanks, mate. Um, what we say? Oh, about the um, about whether they look like what they should look. Yeah. Like. So, for example, you can you can plan. Um, for example, if you take a zip linear and cross it with a mirror, um, you you, you know what you're roughly going to get 25 well you are going to get 25 yeah. percent zip linears 25 percent letters 25 percent commons and 25 percent scattered mirrors uh, but the scattered mirrors can look a bit different mm. um so you there's an element of planning you can plan commons you can plan leathers uh, but in terms of scale pattern what i tend to see is that uh you get um you'll get some that look like mum some that look like dad and some a bit in the middle would you like me to do yes, some thanks, so. Rich? Um, Toby Toby loves this kind of thing. By the way, we hide I'm nothing in these. Pretty podcasts. sure he's buzzing about the fact I knocked that over. <laughs> I bet he is. Can I, Rich? Like I said, you're not the first to have done it. Daryl, Daryl did it in the very early episodes. We had the table a day, <laughs> really, <laughs> and I was reminded of how much the table cost, and like oh, I was told to quick, very, sorry. I was told to look after it, and then first day yeah. we used it daryl did the exact same mate <laughs> well if, if daryl's done it i'm in extremely good company <laughs> just lift yeah. that up lift that coaster up so i'll get that bit underneath of those we'll get terrible water watermarks don't we um well, that's the sign of our age we're worrying about watermarks <sighs> <laughs> right you wouldn't have worried about well, that you when you were what? 20 I'm, gl I'm glad it happened with you si my first um <laughs> yeah if you had done it at your first one it would have been over dan the boss would have been dan would have dan would have loved that he would have done it, everyone actually. loves this um right uh so so yeah you can you can going back to the carpy question yeah. so you yeah you can plan and you're, you're the problem is i guess is that you're as a cart farmer you're trying to make everybody happy all of the time so you 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 want customers want fast growing plain fish they want scaly fish they want long fish they want short fat fish um you know growth rates important people want to buy a fish that grows very quickly 
Uh, so you're trying to juggle all of that. And within a year class, you're trying to create a batch of fish that have got a bit of everything. And that's not always very easy. Now, how, how many of your um, clients or customers, sorry, come to you with who, you know, they actually know what they want? Um, they often say they've got a plan. Well, yeah. we, we definitely see that. So you'll get people come to the farm saying, well, I'm quite keen to uh, like to pick maybe some, some sort of a C4s because we have customers come mm. to the farm, which is great. Is there a bar at which they can then come? Like, do they have to, can they, can anybody come and, and yeah, choose? Yeah, because if someone's having a couple of fish, they can yeah. come to the farm and pick them. So you'll get a guy come out, you know, I'm looking to buy 20 C4s. I'd like to come and pick them. That's perfect. And often they'd come at a weekend and, uh, they'll look in the tank, having said they want mainly plain ones, and then they'll pick 20 scaly ones. I, I see that quite... Because their eyes light up. Because they go, like, oh my God, look how scaly. Oh, look at that absolute banger. I need to have that yeah. one. Imagine that one at 40 pound. And they leave with 20 scaly ones. And then they get home and go, didn't quite have what we planned, <laughs> but we like them anyway. It must be um, a lovely... I mean, I'm sure you're not there for all of these things, but buying fish for your lake, your club, your syndicate, there's nothing but joy in that. Surely. Oh no! It's a, you get the good end of things there, don't you? It's like, very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Unless, I love. I loved when we do the deliveries. <clears throat> very lucky that Sue often comes out with me on deliveries, and when we do the drops, you get to meet some lovely people on a really exciting moment for their fishery. Or you know, pictures and in they go. And yeah, it's quite fun. You're sort of rolling the dice for the future. So, in terms of strains, I know um, it's it's tough to be specific about what what you've got planned, but. How do you improve what you've already got? And are you even looking to improve? Or is it just to make it different? Yeah, no, we want to try and obviously try and improve. So yeah. we select uh, better growing fish to become brood fish, anything that's got specific scale patterns. So there's a couple of scale patterns we're working, hopefully trying to sort of develop at the moment. We've got some fry, which we've, we've kept on that we think have got, a, they're just different looking. Anything that's a bit different, it seems to be popular. Mm. So, um, And in terms of the... You know, initially, I presume you'd picked fish because of the, the the strain was proven to get to a certain size. Yeah, have that has that always proven to be the case? It when, seems when to be. Yeah, it's I mean, born out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, if you get, like, for example, the Sutton strain, which we we use, those fish grew very big. I mean, that's been around a long time, hasn't it? That strain. Yeah, that that, that those fish. Sorry, the, yeah. the brood fish. I guess. Yes, and I think Suttons are probably outside of your. Um, zippy and stuff certain fish are probably the closest to leanies that we can you know, yeah there's a fair amount of evidence yeah. that they were probably very similar along that line yeah. definitely yeah and we um and they remain popular when we produce fish well, like that at the farm because people like me just think well why can't you just make more leanies yeah but but you know they don't grow as well do they well uh, we've had some batches that do and some batches that don't so yeah i mean why take the risk though as a fish yeah we, well Is we that... we mix it up so this year we we've got four uh, produced four batches of fry that went into four production uh, fry ponds and from there we then split them again so that's a job i'm doing with martin tomorrow actually uh, so we're, we'll pull a net through the fry pond so we would have put maybe 20 to thirty thousand fry at a week old into that fry pond um the fry pond's full of plankton it's been manured and filled up uh maybe two weeks before the fry go in there so you haven't got the predators because everything eats a baby carp so the fry have gone in there they've they've now been in the ponds for a couple of months so they'll be this sort of size maybe the front runners will be like that already really so we can pull a net through and then we'll cream off fish and we'll go right we'll put a thousand of those fry and that's that that we really like the particular look of those we'll put a thousand of those in another fry pond mm. and when you take 20 out of a pond of twenty thousand, you take a thousand out and you put them in a, another specially prepared fry pond they absolutely rock it so hopefully by the end of their first summer they'll be like that so 150 grams now it's a question that's always been uh you know foremost for me because i've spent a lot of time talking to you over the years i've been, I've been to the farm I've, I've seen other people's efforts with this kind of thing um those initial flyers mm. can you be precise about the percentage of those which become the cream or no. is it just the way they're treated no, beyond uh, that there's definitely an element of as a as a little carp fry like that if they get a head start they eat a bit more than their brothers and sisters, then the neck, because they're that little bit bigger, even when we're talking fractional, but they can eat a tiny bit more than their brothers and sisters at the next meal. So they that they push that ex advantage and it keeps going and which then you is, end up with the shooters. Which is fine, but that doesn't reflect on their genetics necessarily, does it? No. They might just have got a better start for what, what, yeah. whatever reason. They might not have the upper limit of 
uh, you know, genetic upper limit that some of their siblings yeah. have got. So what we do to try and combat that is we we go back to different our different four fry ponds and take fry from each pond. So we're, we're always looking to try and carry through a, a mixture of the fry so we don't end up, for example, this year's fry, there's some really, really heavily scale ones that look amazing. Masses of big plates on them and they're only like this now, but they're covered. And you think they're going to be very popular, but I don't want them just to be like that mm. because you don't, as you say, they might not end up being the best growers so obviously over the, over 15 years vs has, has had i would say from the outside in a, a fairly transformative effect on on that on your industry you know oh. that 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 the scaly fish that you produced yeah have rippled through now yeah. you know mark simmons now does some you know quite i think highly regarded scaly yeah, yeah, fish. Lovely fish. Uh, i'm sure others ajs mm. are the mm. same um how do you assess where the trends for these things are going? But I, as I said, I, I, I think it's important to try and produce a mixture of fry every year because mm. if it, we always get a few people, like commons is a classic. Have you got any commons? Have you got any commons? So we, got, so we end up scratching around. Look, last <laughs> winter was a classic one. You know, Vivid obviously had a couple of customers that were keen to have commons. Mm. And, you know, suddenly I want 20 commons, Scotty, if we got 20 commons and we're sort of looking under dustbin lids and all around the yard trying to find a common carp, um, you know, and draining ponds frantically yeah. trying to find commons. So you, then you do a batch with a few, more, so this year I've spawned more commons and of course you're going to end up with a situation in five years when nobody wants commons. So you're just trying to balance it all the time to try and create a, a variety of different looking fish. We've got some really cool sort of grey blue mirrors coming through and they're they're, gonna, they're popular now. Yeah, and, and I, I hear that. I hear, you know, what you say about balance but but what has actually happened on the ground it seems is that mm. everywhere is stocked with scaly fish now yeah well, in the last 10 years everywhere mm. they they kind of look quite similar a lot of them as well yeah you know, of course because a scaly carp is a scaly carp yeah it, it, the subtleties often uh, are more um, apparent on the ones that with fewer scales yeah. like you can appreciate the a, a, a cluster or yeah a half linear or whatever mm. um in, in a way we're now stuck with a lot of probably quite big scaly carp which is great well cut it, it? <laughs> yeah oh i've caught a 45 but, pound fully scale mirror yeah but, cut my net handle off yeah, <laughs> but but i think we, are we now seeing a reaction to that in yeah. terms of people wanting well that, uh, that's why these are bluey gray ones that we're doing at the farm yeah. look a bit different again it's just trying to create a mixture isn't it you want the the, the best carp fisheries that you ever go to are where you never know what the next one's going to look like yeah you know, i think of a place i used to fish in the Cotswolds, which unfortunately the otters have cleared out but at that lake when you got a bite you didn't know whether it was going to be a zip linear like that or a big short mm. bodied you know fat thing i've um, just thrown up a uh your website because some of the fish on it is so cool. i'll tell you what the interesting the, that you've got rich rich will be oh, on there look, so this fish is, have got big yeah yeah and uh, but what i was good i was actually going to mention rich shortly because um look at the back of that one oh. that would rich's fish aren't fully scaled and, and no. a lot of them are lightly scaled yeah, was that a choice that he made for no it's right at the start he, when he bought those fish yeah and we didn't have the you know the, the gene pool that we do now um, that's a cool one but actually that they as a fishery that you know, i'm sure he's fully big fully booked all the time and <laughs> yeah and he's got i don't know how many 40 pounders in in mustang now they're all yeah I mean, herds, loads, herds yeah <laughs> and they yeah. are sort of big yeah and it's inter it's such an interesting place because it you know, you, you think back to the time when we were getting into this scene, Rich, mm. that, that 40 pounders lived in very sparsely stocked, big open windswept pits. And that his place is just the, not like that at all, no. is it? It's small, it's it's heavily fished. Um, Does Rich still have fish or, or is he happy with this? I think he's pretty much done with what he's got. Cause yeah. He, so you run out like, of space. I, don't don't know, you like I feel like there's maybe 10 or more 40, 40 pound. I don't know how, yeah. I've never visited the site. Yeah, but, I, I haven't either. Not um, but it's, no, it's never I don't get the sense it's a huge lake, but no. I think it's fairly fully booked, it's, isn't it? Yeah, so, it's know, busy, busy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Rich is evidence of what can be yeah. done with, with your fish, I guess. Yeah. And he must have had them like within the first few years. Yeah, it was within the first couple of years, I would think, so early doors, yeah. So a real good case study for what yeah, can you have. can do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, these the, the leathery ones. So what about the sort of, you know, you and I have spoken, I'm sure, like 10 years ago plus about about strains that have sort of disappeared and, and, and gone by the by, mm. um, which, we, you know, it's a shame. Like, I think the, the kind of principal one that springs to mind is the car park. There's the mm. Yateley strain, if you like, those original fish. And I think we want to, well, I want to talk to you a bit about Yateley, actually. But um, <laughs> they slipped through the net. And I think there were voices at the time yeah um outside of semex that that really wanted that to happen mm. and it could it would have been so easy to do wouldn't it 
<laughs> well, it would have been for you. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was a lake that you were at, so yes. you know, I'm just going to put the blame at your feet there. Oh, no, so. it's totally my fault. <laughs> I accept any mistakes were yeah, on no, me. No, no, no. <laughs> but, well, but, I was going to, I mean, there was talk of just trying to spawn from Mary. Oh, just imagine. It's been so such cool. Such a risk though, right? Is it, but no, is but it? Maybe it not to get a tiny drip of sperm from a male fish. Right. You know, when, when Mary was out on the unhooking mat, it, he used to produce sperm at the vent. That's quite really? common in male fish. So you could have just taken a little pipette of that off, put it on ice in pure oxygen and buzzed it down to uh, you know, get the hatchery running and we would have had a chance. I mean, I always, I uh, when I keep sperm, the sperm samples at the farm in the fridge, yeah. I can I can check the viability even after two or three days. It's still it's pretty durable stuff. Yeah, pretty hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. So still running. So you think well, you only needed a few of them. To... Surely the Mary, the Mary and VS didn't. There was no crossover. But you're talking about when you were at Sparshaw, yeah. presumably. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um. Well, I mean, are there contemporary fish that? I mean, a lot of your fish are, are Mary yeah. sized now. Though there, aren't they? there so, are now. Yeah. So really, perhaps, pounders, perhaps, yeah. um, does the fascination with Mary? beyond your own fishing for it, extend to the fact that it, it was a, a, a much bigger fish than anything else we had at a time when there weren't loads of big mm. carp. Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, could it have got bigger today in today's environment? I reckon. Yeah, yeah you think so. Yeah, yeah so, I reckon. So actually that would have been potentially a sort of freak in inverted commas in whatever. Yeah, imagine it in today's world of baiting and up yeah. and everything. You know, yeah. It wouldn't have been coming across half a can of sweet corn, would it? It would have been coming well, across like a table load of bait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, obviously you've- I think we're gonna, we might talk about Nutsy later, might we? we we're going to talk about nutsy. But also, that that fish, yeah. I always think. Imagine if you'd taken that mirror, which was just a, a, a huge, huge carp living in in that pond. If you'd taken the nutsy mirror and put it into somewhere like Raysbury with the mm. food that Raysbury had in it, how does it work? It works it, like that. It's as simple think, as that. I think it could have more got, access to food. Yeah, you know, it's going yeah. to get bigger. Yeah, I think you know, it hadn't topped out. It, no, it's I genetic. Think it, I think it because. The Nazi fish was quite a friendly fish. It spent quite a lot of time on the bank. Mm. If it had spent more time in the water, it surely would have got bigger. But hugely long, right? It was I a mean, huge what, fish. Let's, let's talk about it now, Sorry, because you know we've, we've flagged it up. Let's talk about Nutsy. Uh, not not a fish that actually I've heard anyone talk about for quite a few years. But you know, it's, de oh, it's dead. But yeah. it was a fish that was fairly local to you. Yeah, well, so I was uh, living in West Sussex. Uh, I was fishing a bit in Chichester with a guy called John Rose, who's a very, very, very competent angler. And somewhere around that period, um, I heard about this place um, near uh, near Totten called Nutsy. And um, yeah, I thought, well, I, I had to go and have a look because I was, I was working for a company called McAllister Elliott Partners, and it was my sort of first job after university. And I was doing fishery consultancy work for them. And we were, I was having to do uh, calculations of compensation payments for the International Oil Pollution Compensation Fund, which for a bloke who can't do maths is quite a terrible, scary thought. Um, but I was sort of it, down, so I was down in, in Limington. So Nazi wasn't that far away. Mm. And um, so I went and had a look at the lake and it seemed tiny. And I thought, well, there's two 30 pounders in here, a common and a mirror. And um, they, they kind of edged, back and forth as to which was going to be the bigger fish. Anyway, I went down there, I got my ticket and I went down there and um, there was this sort of, it was an island, but it was out of the water. Obviously an island is out of the water, but it's like this gravel hump, maybe about the size of this studio that was stuck out of the water and you could walk onto it. But I cast over to that and I went around and baited up with some crumb and, um, and some, I remember there's some, cav some lumpfish caviar mixed in with it. And uh, I caught three or four that night, including the big common. And right. uh, yeah, it was quite yeah. early in the spring. It was in, I remember the shot, it's me with a ponytail, long ponytail, holding this big common, 32 pound, and uh, their bluebells were in the background. Amazing. And it was huge fish. Yeah, and it was my personal best at, the, at that point. And I remember ringing John Rose and going, I haven't caught, a, I hadn't caught a 20 pound common at that point. I said, oh, I haven't caught a 20 pound common. I've caught a 30 pound common. And John was like, oh, amazing, amazing. And uh, yeah, did, did myself takes of it. And, uh, Put it back, and I, I caught the same night. I caught a fish called the strawberry fish, which is yeah. another of the sort Fully after. Scaled, so. Yeah, it was another real sort after fish in there, and uh, yeah, fished there on and off a bit more, but I never caught the mirror. And I remember Ben and I fished it a little bit um, when we were teaching at Spa Shell, and uh, it was always a, it was a little lake. Um, it was really interesting lake because it, it was very very weedy in the summer. It had a lot of a plant called hornwort in it, uh, which is, looks a bit like a sort of submerged Christmas tree. And it used to struggle with oxygen levels. So at night, 
nothing would move. It's like at night time, that oxygen level would just, just drop and the fish would just literally stop. So you never got bites at night. It was, you could literally have heard a pin drop at night. You know, like any other carp lake, you did one go badoosh in the early hours, not at Nutsy. Right. It was absolutely dead at night. And then at first light, they'd start to- What do you think they were doing in that time? Just sitting, I think, thinking- That's I'm what carp to, do when- I'm literally going to suffocate if I swim anywhere. So they, right. would, they would just sit dead still. It was so, the whole lake was dead at night. I haven't been there for a long time. Maybe different now, but back then it used to, you'd never get, you couldn't get a bite at night. You couldn't try anything. And I remember chatting to Terry when he was there after I'd been, and he, he couldn't get bites at night. It was, you know, just didn't fish at night. And it was, I'm sure hundred percent it was down to oxygen content of the water. Very sheltered lake. Sheltered with trees all the way around it. I don't know, we all, as carp fishermen, we love a tree, but you want wind on that water. The trees around the lake are not so good. So leaf litter going in in the autumn. So there would have been a, a quite a thick leaf litter layer, lots of rotting weed, uh, hot, warm water. And um, yeah, the fish just didn't move at night. And um, anyway, I, I went there with Ben a bit in the winter. We fished a bit in the winter and caught there was lots of tench, caught from tench. And I remember saying to Ben, I've had enough of Nazi. I'm not going to go back. And I very flippantly said, I ain't not coming back to this place. I won't repeat exactly what I said until that mirror is a 50 pounder. And that was the end of that. And about six years later, Ben rings me up and goes, I've got some news for you. And I went, what was that, mate? And he goes, um, you need to go and buy a Nazi ticket. I went, why? It, James, I think it was James Anderson. James Anderson has just caught the Nazi fish over 50. It was like, no way. <laughs> You're joking. Oh, Oh God, it was like, and I got frustrated because I, anyway, so the next afternoon I drove and bought the ticket and uh, I did a couple of trips and I think the third trip I called it out the edge. No, <laughs> we're not going to gloss too much over that. We need to, we need a bit of detail on this <laughs> side, but, but first of all, describe to us what the Nutsy Mirror is like. And this is maybe a challenge for Toby. Can you find us the Nutsy Mirror, mate? Oh, yeah, hopefully Toby will find it quickly <laughs> but enough. No, but because it's an interesting carp. It, oh, it was a very cool carp. It was it was like a whale swimming in a goldfish bowl. I mean, it was it was just, the, the lake was, reason, as we've alluded to, reasonably small, um, quite clear, very weedy. Um, with uh, There's a couple of bars and stuff where you get clear, you know, there'd be clear water you could fish onto. But... Uh, there was quite a lot of fully scaled and they're heavily scaled fish. And then there was this big common, which had died by the time I went back. But And then this just gigantic mirror. And it was a really big, long fish. Mm. It, was, it was a huge, huge car. Hugely long tail wrist. From yeah, it was just tail. a massive yeah. fish. It, it, was, it was all out of... How, so skeletally size, so like in terms of growth, what has happened with that carp? Because, you know, the common stayed 32 pound, didn't it? Yeah, more it or less. Did. And that yeah. fish somehow... Did it find an extra, can they grow again? Or was can, it, I wondered if it was a different, had it come from a different source? Has someone in Totten had a goldfish pond that they'd emptied and, you know, with oh, it? Oh, no, no, I'm, yeah. But it, I'm, I'm more, more saying in the sense that the common topped out, but the mirror just kept going somehow, it kept yeah. going. I, I, I mean, it was, it was an amazing, hopefully Toby will find the picture, but it was an incredibly long fish. Mm. Um, just a huge fish but what uh, the other thing that about it was really interesting and i'd set out my stall when i went there for this is it got caught off the top a lot mm. nine captures out of ten were off the top you'd often meet people i remember meeting a guy who'd caught it five times off the top right. with floaters down there right thinking okay um there are other lakes in hampshire you could yeah. go and have a crack at now because I, I could have caught one of those other catches yeah, yeah. could have been me. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I, but I was determined to catch it off the bottom. I thought, no, I'm going to catch you off the bottom because yeah. I'm a rubbish floater fisherman. Well, um, I um, I have found it, but unfortunately it's not your capture, so I'm not, oh. I think I've got Terry's one. I'll oh, well, that'll definitely yeah, yeah. do. So, so Terry was... Um, far, yeah. yeah, there you go. Look so, at that. Well so done, mate. Yeah, look at that. It's a big fish. So that was after you'd... Caught that was or? after I caught it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I remember where I was when Terry caught that. I was in the middle of the South Lake at Raysbury and the phone goes, because I said to Terry, if, when you catch it, mm. ring me and I'll come and help you with the pictures because I'm not living a million miles away. And uh, the phone went and I was in the middle of the South Lake at, yeah, at Raysbury and I said, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, Terry, but I'm not available for pictures. But yeah, there it is. What a long fish. And a floater capture uh, as well. Terry's so well, there you go yeah it like it like floaters it got caught off the top a lot um but yeah big big just such a big fish in that pond but how the, big is the pond Ty? uh I'm wanting to say three or four acres and there was a 
I remember from I think Terry's account of it, there was a, a sort of a back bay. Yeah, two. So it was kind of like a like crab shaped, yeah. with two big claws. So you had the main body of the lake, and then you had these two arms that went off, and they were all overgrown and you know all yeah. super carpy, and they were out of bounds. Obviously, uh, yeah. <laughs> so the fish obviously spent a lot of time living, and people used there was a I remember right, it was a rope, and people used to fish as close to the rope as they possibly could. I kind of feel like there was a telegraph pole laid yeah, across. That's right. It? Yeah, there was yeah. a telegraph pole, that, and you. Yeah, well, I you, mean, does that work? Fishing, uh, surely, they, surely, if they know that there's a they come under the telegraph yeah. pole, I think I'm in the danger yeah. zone now. So, how much time did that fish spend in in the? It outbounds? was quite a bit, but I, I, I when I when I went there after it being caught at fifty pound, um, I found the first time the first day I went there, I found it in open water. There had been some spawning going on, and it, it's quirky that one. It, I don't ever remember it spawning, but it was there feeding on the spawn, and it was it was. It was like, ah, oh, there's, there's food everywhere. And it dive on the bottom and tear up the bottom over here, eating spawn. And then it swim off in a bit of a, root, a loop round. Then it come in and eat over there. And I was picking in rods and moving rods round all over the place. And I did catch three in the day, but not, not that one. But every time I, I'd move a rod to a spot, it would drop down on a spot and feed. And you put a rig on that spot and think, right, that's the money spot. I'm gonna, you know, when it comes back around on this circuit, it's going to drop in there and it's going to make a mistake. And it didn't. It would drop down over there or over there. And it, you could see it was it was like a kid in a sweet shop. Okay, there's just eggs everywhere. And it was clearly hoovering them up. It'd have a good old feed and then it would go off. And anyway, I, I, I did the day. And I so I think I caught three that day, including a 20-something pound fully scaled. And um, the fish were, there were definitely, there were carp feeding, um, but you know, anyway, I did, I, my chance didn't come. And I think about a week later, I had a, a, a chance and I walked around, did a couple of laps and I'd seen it on the opposite side. And um, it was it was in this area and it fed it on the bottom a couple of times, right, I can still picture it right now, feeding down there and thinking, it's here, it's quite quiet on this bank. There's a couple of anglers on the other side. It's dropped on that spot there and that spot there. Now, the one thing I'd sussed previously about that fish is it was quite tricky off gravel. So it, it seemed to me that that fish, it, it, it slipped up all the time on floaters, but people that were fishing on the clear spots, it was obviously coming in and not getting caught. So I pushed the weed back out of my margin on the right-hand side uh, and I, I found the gravel ran down beautifully and then it went into silt. And mm. I remember pushing the weed back and putting a rig into the silt and then bringing the weed back over the top. That was my right hand rod. I did the same thing on the left hand side. And the fish was around a bit in the afternoon and into the evening. And it was in, the, in an area, I think, you know, looking at sort of about the size of this studio, it was around, it disappeared under the weed and reappear and have a mooch about. And I, I put in um, some, um, I was using the Monster Red then, one of Mark's early baits, this really, really red spicy stuff. But I put a bit of that in up, up on the spots where I covered them up. And, and then it got dark. And of course, then it was nutsy. So every, it was like someone just turned the, the, the lake, got switched off. So yeah. the whole thing went completely dead. And at first light, I was, I'd made my coffee and I sat, sat back in the swim and the rods were at the front of the swim and my son falling down brolly and collapsed bed chair was somewhere behind me. And I sat there and it was all really, really quiet. And as the, as the light welled up, the thing, you know, you see a rud dimple and stuff would start to happen. And I definitely seen the a reed bed move, the weed bed moving about. And um, I was sort of thinking now this is looking quite good. And literally with that, the right hand rod just pulled round and I picked the rod up. And as I lifted into the, the bite, I, I see the Nazi mirror just went straight past me. It's like, that's the one then. It was li literally just there. Mm. And it was, I was fishing, you know, it was right in the edge, but I was, the rods were on buzzers because I'd obviously done through the night. And, uh, and then we had a quite a protracted battle in close. It went round and round. You could sit, you know, all the time, you could yep. see this huge long cart. And uh, you're thinking, yeah, yeah. And I was trying to look calm and I could see matey opposite me looking and I'm thinking, just try and keep your head together. And it went round a bit and eventually it went in the landing net. And obviously I must have I must have smiled too much because within a split second, he'd shot round and uh, we got the fish out. And um, yeah, so he set about weighing and it weighed, for, I think it was 49 pounds and something, 49 pounds. But anyway, and I remember the guy, it's so funny. Because I guess I've been doing it a while now, so I've become less worried about exact weights of fish, um, with one exception. Uh, but the, but <laughs> so I weighed it, and it was forty nine. He goes, "Oh mate, do you want me to go and get my scales, and we can yeah. weigh it on my scales and yeah. see if it's fifty pound?" It's like, no, nah, it doesn't. 
Does, it really doesn't matter. £49 is still a very, very big cart. No. But it was a funny moment. Oh, do you want me to go my guy's scales? He was obviously trying to be, you know, what a charming offer. Oh, I'm all right. Thanks, mate. I, I think as well, so si, having fished uh, or certainly filmed you fishing enough times that it's kind of lucky that the fish, you had a bite at first light because you are apt to get itchy feet pretty quick, aren't you? Yeah, normally by, yeah. First <laughs> by, light, I mean, you're... But but you're I looking aren't you? Yeah yeah I like, I'm quite mobile. I, I yeah. get very bored very quickly. Yeah. But luckily that one took it out your own took it out your hands. Yeah. Otherwise. But I'd set the traps well. It was got it had all gone in so well in the evening, and I thought if if she's here at first light, then I'm on, I'm on yeah. it. So for once you were content. Yeah. Well yeah I didn't have to wait very long. Um, talk to us a little bit about the the presentation side of things for that because I'm you know I've, as always I've got Dan on one shoulder. Yeah. And he's going to want to know. Well obviously it was, they were all quarter components. And it was a quarter lead. And I think well, this wasn't that long ago. Was it, it? wasn't was it 10 no, years ago, maybe? Exactly. It would have been. So yeah. it would have been uh, almost 100%. Uh, it predates Kamakura hooks, which I'm a massive fan of now. But the, it would have been a size six wide gape. It would have been shrink tubing. The classic Scotty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very simple. So a long, a long piece of shrink tubing, maybe half a piece of shrink tubing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, I think it's, if I remember rightly, it was two or three broken bits of boilie on the hair. Um, and then on a bit of um, strip back coated braid, okay. something like that. Yeah. So pretty in line lead or uh, no? I think it was because I was fishing in that sediment yeah. just down, so it was on a lead clip. And do you? I'm sure you've done it in the past. Would you naturally want the lead to sit inside the, the silt? So yeah. So the, I like it just to plug into. Do you the bury silt. it? Do you push it in with a net or anything? I didn't like that? need to then because no. it just it went. That, that, as that gravel went, Nazi had quite big gravel, quite big stones, and uh, it, as it went down, the silt layer came across, and I just went past that. So. It was, just tucked in so that fish would have turned and gone down and lead lead core or no no I'm nothing not, i've never been a great lead core fan i could no no i've never got on just a little well. bit of tubing yeah so probably yeah. yeah 18 inches of tubing mm. uh, and um you're happy that just slack enough lines would yeah they the were contours yeah yeah and then I, i'm a great fan of putty dotted along the line so particularly in that short range stuff mm. um and often you'll get you know a 49 pound carp is like that you know, so it's a big fish so when that's down in a confined space there's a lot of fins moving about and often big you, fins on that as well yeah often you get the old yeah dee -dee -dee on the bobbin threads. but you hadn't had a peep that morning no no it was all very quiet but um and how much bait was down there uh, i think it probably been about 21 bits of broken up boilie mm -hmm. it's got to be multiples seven of seven every yeah. time yeah. <laughs> you're not the only one seven kilos I, yeah. 20 just broken boilie no pellet no, no, no. It's just literally broken up bits. I of always remember you telling me about. I think you dropped a, a single pellet in the edge once on there, and the, and a fish came in and went down on that single yeah. pellet. Well, that, yes, that's a great tip. Yes, just hook because it's to, to show. I think it was to demonstrate to me certainly about the power of just one pellet. Yeah, yeah. The smell that comes but, out on there. Uh, uh, yeah, single baits. I mean, uh, it takes you some head bending to get your head around using a single tiger nut. Mm. But um, I remember the first time I caught a carp on a single tiger nut, and you think you look at a tiger nut, and it's like an inert pebble. Yes. <sighs> Such a good bait. Yeah. Oh, jeez, they can, they can, they'll pick up a single tiger nut can, in acres. I want, I want to talk a little bit about these this marginal trap setting because it is something that you know you do a lot of by yeah. choice i seem it? to end up in that situation but you actually that's what you prefer as well isn't it yeah to see it, it feels more you're more in touch with what you're actually yeah. fishing so in terms of the way the weed let's say at nutsy was sitting and, and and the way that weed tends to sit in the marginal spots do you look for a certain type of configuration in terms of how the fish can access the spot yeah if i can make it awkward for them to get in that's good because it oh really yeah because so i think the opposite was no, True. but you're making it more difficult for them to to come in. If they're coming in on a spot and it's like this table, yeah, and you're you're giving them loads of space, and and then it's I think you're making it easier for them. So okay. I'd almost rather have them twisting and turning a little. That's bit. That's really interesting. I've never heard anyone say that. But but uh, then perhaps we haven't asked the right questions yeah. of you. So. But you want you want to, yeah. If a carp is in a confined space yeah. and it's having to twist to get round and and feed, then it's much harder for it to to be concentrating on I've, I've, i think that was a bit sharp back up because it's twisted a bit anyway yeah. so yeah I don't, I don't so you don't mind these l little sort of blind endings no you're happy with that yeah i think that's See, all right that's good what about as long as it doesn't if it's it, it, you need the traffic though don't you, you want yes. the fish to come through so um, and how and are you relying on on what bait you've got down there to sort of permeate the water and, and drag them off from their main route yeah. into well, these in, little... in the situation of nutsy that fish was obviously working its way around the weed beds and and 
that spot I'd seen him feed very close to that. So I thought that's my I guess the other big unknown for me is always how much uh space there are under these weed beds, how many channel how many tunnels if you like and yeah. how they move around within oh, them. Massively. And they're like I remember at Raysbury diving down um it, it, into 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 amongst the, the weeds to, to spots on the bottom and you'd get down there you know you'd have your face mask on your snorkel and your flippers and you you'd think that from above that looked like just a clear patch but when you get down there there was just tunnels going off into the weed in all directions so really you know what you're looking at it's like the tip of the iceberg isn't it you know there's a there's lots of weed up there on the surface but underneath they're hollow and actually it makes no sense for it to be because it, it, it gets no access to light no, so, so it's hollow so often you know i remember watching fish so many times now but you see a carp swimming along it'll disappear into what looks like a very small hole in the weed and then it'll appear 10 meters away out of another hole so they're just tunnels on there so so in the main side these are caverns are yeah. they underneath carp caves yeah, yeah. coffee what, caves a bed of what like um what we'd consider Canadian pondweed, for instance, yeah. does, is that tunneled out as well? Yeah, de yeah, definitely. I mean, different weed at different times. So for example, hornwort, which I've mentioned, mm -hmm. and Nutsy, when it's coming up, it forms this really quite a dense bed as it comes to the surface. Once it gets to the surface, it breaks along the surface. Um, um, Eladir, Canadian pondweed, um, yeah, again, a bit different in the way they grow. So getting a bit of an idea of what weeds, how they do mm -hmm. is, is good. And would you select um, certain weed beds over and above others in terms of what they can hold because often in summer their fish will spend a lot of time in and under these canopies won't they mm. um no I'd, I'd pick the spots more on where i'm seeing the fish i yeah. think rather than go right that's a specific weed mm -hmm. hornwort is quite an interesting one because it doesn't have roots so if you get yourself a weed rake and keep casting you can clear spots no, mm. it's more difficult when it's 15 foot from the bottom to the top uh, but early in the year hornwort tends to grow um, in areas that the other weeds don't go. And in my experience with hornwork, if, particularly early in the summer, you, if you get a weed rate, you can cast and clear spots quite nicely and because it mm. doesn't have the root, you just drag it out of the way. Mm. They make great spots. They've caught plenty of fish like that. And quite often these, but by their nature, presumably, weed beds are rooted in silt, mm. right? And you get the gravel spots that run up to them, yeah. maybe. Would you always be preferring to find somewhere softer? Yeah, um, well, I, I, that takes me to a, a raspberry catcher. Um, a couple of raspberry catches off a, off a gravelly hump, but mm. I, I didn't catch the fish off the gravel. I caught them off the silt at the bottom of the slope where it met the weed. Mm. And I, again, I just I think often on, on gravel, you take this tabletop, you're, you're presenting the fish with a very easy feeding situation where it, it, it's got space, it can, it can probably see reasonably well because by its very nature, the gravel hump's a bit shallower. Yeah. Uh, so the light penetration's good. There's no sediment. So when it's hoovering, it's hoovering up just the bits of food as it goes along and obviously tiny bits of gravel. But you put that carp into a silty situation, there's a bit of food buried in the sediment. There's bits of leaf litter. There's bits of rotting weed. There's stems of uh, weed there. As it hoovers up stuff, there's more bits of debris going over its lips. And that might buy you a split second longer mm -hmm. when the rig goes in mm -hmm. before it goes, hang on a minute. Yeah, you know, it, I, I use. I remember writing a, an article about if if you get your girlfriend to give you strawberries, if she blindfolded you mm -hmm. and she gave you strawberries one at a time, you'd take them in your mouth. I think these taste nice. But if she gave you one with a stalk in it, you'd know in an instant when mm -hmm. you'd go, you'd straight away, you'd feel there was something yeah. attached to that strawberry. So and I sort of liken that to the fish feeding on clean gravel. It's, it's very, very easy. Whereas if they're feeding in the debris and sediment and there's, I remember watching a pug at Raysbury coming up with a bit of stick like that in its mouth and its, mm. its lips were going and it obviously had a mouth full of food as well and it was you could see it like i've got a stick in my mouth and it swum off mm. and then it spat the stick out and i thought if that had been my rig i would have caught that fish because he it took him too long to get the stick out yeah i think that, that that's part of a chat that i've had with you in the past and presumably other people have as well about whether actually something that isn't food is going to hook you more fish than something that they yeah. recognize as potentially dangerous because in the mouth if it, if it just hoovers up something because it might look like food, but actually in the mouth it's just debris, yeah. it, it, there's no alarm it could, bells. You could write and swim off and yeah. you hook it. Whereas when you suck up a boilie and start moving and it doesn't move in your mouth like you expect it to, then mm. you might think, hang on a minute, and blow very hard. Now, the, the, the sort of Scotty rig that we just discussed, <laughs> it hasn't changed in the time I've known you. Talk to me about why you're so confident with that particular I think just because I've caught so many fish on it so so but many never fish. tweaked it i, I have remember. i've got some rigs with me here actually have got, you? <laughs> yeah um but it 
the, the variation. Get them out, si. Let's oh, have the rigs out. No. <laughs> We're gonna, I'll, I knew do my best was, to describe this. This was a mistake. This. Yeah. I'll do my best to describe so, this. Uh, for the yeah, there we, so, yeah, no. So. There's one. This is a new um, champagne cork. This is a, this is a, no, it's not, it's an old one, but that, that there's a, there's but it's not the champagne no, cork no, with all your baking uh, needles stuck a, in that, that was a 42 pounder. Can I, uh, um, it's a 42 pounder. So pretty basic stuff. So that is, that is the pretty much the variation. I'm gonna, if you hand it out, I'm going to try and describe this. So what we've got, basically we've got the, uh, are you using link loops as well? So, si? um, yeah, I've got, I've, come, I've jumped. I've come forward a decade okay. or two. <laughs> but well, we've got the coated braid. We've got about an inch of strip back. Yeah. Um, any particular reason that it's that, it's that long? No, you, it depends. It could be I, much, much shorter, couldn't it, if you wanted it? Yeah, no, that's incompetence with tying knots. Okay, yeah. cool. And, and your, little, your little join is covered up with a sinker, and then we've got the... Can I pop this out? Just so can, yeah, of course. Right? Yeah, yeah. So is that size six? Uh, yeah, that's the size yeah, six wide gate. gate. Yeah, yeah um, with, with small, sh uh, the medium shrink tube. That is pretty much my go-to. And, um, and crucially, they're the liner liner side. Yeah, I'm um, a massive fan of that. I think that's... Uh, so we've got an inch of shrink tube, isn't it? Something like that? Yeah, it's big, yeah. normally about half a piece. Yes, um, and the liner liner's two or three mil up from the bottom. Talk to me about the, the, the significance of the line liner. I mean, a Jim Gibbonton invention. Yeah. I, I, no one seems to use anymore. No, I mean, well, I, I can't see why not really. It's a, it's a fantastic setup that, and it's it, it, it turning that hook over very well. I mean, it's like a big bent hook, isn't it? Having mm. that shank extension and it's making the, the, the mechanics of that rig. So I you're think, fixing, work. because it because the, 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 the coated braid comes out from the side wall of the shrink tube. Yeah. You're fixing that within the shrink tube as, as opposed to being able to move within the aperture of the end of the shrink tube. Is yeah. that, that's yes. the idea. Yeah. And because it's in line with the point, that's always going to naturally favor. Should always, you're liking the idea of it flipping over. Yes. And good. I've caught fish with that exact setup with uh, wafters, straight bottom baits or pop-ups, mm. you know, and it's it very, very adaptable. I like, I like a lot the way you're holding it now yeah. with a hook sitting like Dangling that. Dangling down. I yeah. like with that hook sitting just like that on the bottom. That's how you'd... That would be my absolute perfect setup. You know, so if I was going to, for example, two tiger nuts on there, mm. I'd have, I'd have the bottom one would be a small, normal tiger nut. And then I'd put a drilled out one with a bit of cork and I'd trim it back to get that hook to sit. So it literally sinks and uh, lands. And set actually, up. what is a bit different though, so si, is that you've got the hair coming straight out of the knot that's not towards the eye of the hook. Yeah. So you've got a lot of hook um, above or below, depending on which way you want to yeah. skin it. But you've got a lot of hook um, available. Free. There's no... Yeah. Um, no ring. A little bit of silicone or rig ring. No, I might. I mean, I had to tinker with that. I, I was tried. Just, I'm sure I've seen yeah, the rig I, rings. I, yeah, um, <laughs> but but I actually quite like. It's almost got. It's got that kind of. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a yeah. There's a more modern That's version. That's a Burfield rig, surely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, that looks like a rainbow rig, so. Si. What? With the, <laughs> with the, the screen. Do you like the multicolored corn? <laughs> there's a multicolored corn on the go here, yeah. which is. Uh, I'll just pop this rig back into here. Um, but I think I mean this is a. Go. There's there's Hand one that back. This is, I mean, this was experimental times, but I caught, this is the rig I caught Mary's mate on. No. Yeah. <laughs> Let me have a bit of a reflected glory, so. Si. <laughs> Look at this. This is a size, I think it's a size eight or what, a What are these, the actual cork, the champagne corks from the time? Uh, possibly, Rich, yes. I don't want anybody to think I'm alcoholic. No, but you know. <laughs> there you go, look with, at that. You'd be within your rights. Let me have a look. So this is a mono rig. Yeah. Um, that was August the 2nd, at 2001. Hook is minuscule it's a size 10 mate but that's a drennan 10 isn't it that's one of the old uh yeah. that's, that's a raptor i think one of the very pre the, even the pre teflon yeah um, very small it, like it's a realistically that to me that's a size 12 or something now yeah i think it's a 10 i think um yeah August and a berkeley swivel like an old school yeah. like <laughs> one of the old <laughs> old school uh, uh, 6 a.m on the 20 uh 2001 and that's a tiny D, like a, a tiny D rig. Yeah, I, mean, I think actually, I've been chatting to Cockle. I yeah. think that's a Cockle thing. And yeah. um, Mark Tollen, for those who yes. don't know who Cockle is. And um, yeah, I, fi I fished with him. And yes, yeah, so, I so say that that was a, I've mentioned, I think I've probably mentioned that capture before, but that was so interesting because there were some bits of gravel sitting on the blanket weed. Yeah. And I looked down through the bucket on the spot and you see these little stones and you think, stones don't generally sit on top of the blanket weed. And I put the rig down. I think it was on a, a half a peanut or something I had on there. That's quite a long hair for half a peanut, isn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, and, you, and you don't, uh, it's mounted directly on the D, the hair. Interestingly, it's <laughs> it's a looped braid that's mounted on a tiny D on the back of this tiny hook. 
and uh, it's free. It's running on D, just oh, on the loop God. itself. There's no, there's no rig ring, is, is there? No, um, no, no. But the hook, I'm fascinated by, Sai, because albeit it's forged, it looks woefully ill-equipped to deal with a fish like Mary's mate, which was a, a known rocker, yeah. wasn't it? It did. It, yeah, it was. It was a good boat battle. I remember yeah. that but, quite well. But I remember quite... playing it so gingerly. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's absolutely the hook is minuscule. <laughs> but, uh, well, I think I chatted to Cockle too much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and there's there's this is a, there's another rig very similar. And what would this mono have been, Sai? Uh, that would have been twelve pounds straight off. Uh, straight off the spool. Straight off the spool. Yeah. You didn't mess around, did you? <laughs> Were they... Well, back then, cop the cop didn't know. I mean, is that a is that that's a knotless knot? And yeah. you blobbed it. I mean, look, the D rig was was in use in two thousand and one. Who would have believed? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there you are. This is a yeah. That that's the one I had Malins on. I'm going to hand this one back. Okay, um, I'll in put case that I back on it. its cork. Yeah. And the Malins one is in much more sort of standard standard. It looks fare. like snake um, bite. Yeah. So one of the very first coated braids. braids. Yeah. Thick as you like. But very um, very strong. Yeah. Um, shrink tube. Yeah. Same, that's same definitely half a piece of shrink tube. And then I was using a, a tiny ring then. Yeah, so uh, you've got the same loop of braid, but yeah. this time on a ring, and that's yeah. a looks like a, a, a I think that was Kamasan, a Carpar Russ. Oh, is it? Maybe a Carpar Russ nailer or a Centurion. It's very sharp and very strong. It was. Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a, I it's thought. a one of your yeah. Well, but but looking at it, so it's, if it's forged, it isn't forged a lot. Yeah, it's a round in the wire. Um, but it's a what they call like a shrimp pattern, isn't it? What the, a yeah. lot of the the, the sort of more your curve shank type yeah. hooks were based on, I think, or maybe not the cord one, but whatever um, those original curve sort of patterns were based around. Um, this one's not as sharp as that little tiny one. No. But this one was what, Malins, did you say? Yeah, it was Malins, yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, you weren't, That's that That looks a little bit more uh, equipped to deal with. It, it looks quite brain. small now though, I think. It does. Yeah. It does compared to, uh, a, but then those are other rosebrook, so you can see the same. But you, I mean, you were quite, you were quite early on the wide gapes. I've used, memory. You, yeah, I love the wide I mean, gapes. Since, as soon as they came out, I thought they were great. Yeah. Oh, these are, and these are all the same now. These are yeah. these are what Pug Mary's. Yeah, Mary's mate Pug. Uh, July two thousand and three, um, and they are all, for the purposes of those listening, the same shrimp type pattern with a, a swept shank and a, and yeah. a heavily. I remember that period eye. when we we yeah. used those hooks. Um, uh, long section shrink tube, quite, and these are really short. So, yeah, they would were. these have been attached they're, to some they're enormous placed, lead? Yeah, there would have been an eight ounce clock lead on them. <laughs> yeah, poor old fish. Um, but yeah, those were those were placed, and remembering they were placed from the boat, so yeah. they would have been lowered onto spots just on the side of gravel. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they're incredible. But, but so the rig, yeah, my rigs haven't changed. I, but I think just want to be confident. I mean, what yeah, it does demonstrate is that, quite, is a, that is a modern Burfield rig, as we said. Let's have a look at that one. That, that's, see. Uh, yeah. So this one's got a big section of stiff fluorocarbon. Yeah, boom. Yeah. Just, just, which is doing the same as the um, the strip back stuff we've talked yeah. about. And then you've got a little flexible section, half a piece of shrink tube again, liner, liner. Great big hook this time, uh, size four. Uh, yeah, four, size four, Kamakura, Kamakura wide yeah. gate, X. And then Oh, little, God, the, I've got confidence in those. And then a little kebab of... Um, Plastic, it, yeah. Uh, plastic, yeah. Um, are you gooing the plastic? Because that, uh, that's about the only thing I found that actually stays. Yeah. Or, it. Well, I, was, I soaked them in. Used to soak them in Mark's Royal Marine. Oh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. It's yeah, got yeah. that horrible. Yeah, scent that from equally hell in lingering, it. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and we, what fish did you catch on this? I'm not telling you that because it's. Well, <laughs> it's I, can, I can feel a little bird over bits. Yeah. It's obviously been involved that's in been a capture. Involved in a capture. <laughs> oh, well, it's it's just nice to hold it, but I mean, and this is a quick change one as well. Yes, yeah. So uh, say quick. You still got a snip. The Mark Bryant off, used so. to get. Mark was uh, really inf instrumental in me getting on those because that that setup with that that heavy heavy boom and it's not um, unlike his Meccano rig no it's very very yeah. similar and you yeah. so you could quite quickly you know tie rigs up so it mm. could work well and quite long cycle in comparison to the others that yeah you, was that a consideration Silty with the particular fish was. you were yeah you were fishing for no, it's just how long it was tied rich okay. <laughs> <laughs> no I had a different spots different spots yeah I, and the but still I mean you'd get yeah. away with a short rig wouldn't you, or you, you yeah you, especially dropping from a boat yeah um, but what it does demonstrate quite nicely, size si, is that the, you've the, been the rigs have been very, very similar. similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think you can go a lot, a lot worse than buy a packet of shrink tube. Definitely. Well, you'd got through a lot of shrink tube. In I the last have used years. a lot of shrink tube. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the 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 change from the swept shank to the kind of more square 
notched um, bend of the yeah. uh, of the wide gapers. And where did that come from? But that, it, it, these rigs came out in a, in a very ancient looking. Box. I made that in carpentry. I was gonna. That would have been my next question. <laughs> Those are dovetail joints, Rich. You might not yeah. recognise them initially. <laughs> no, they don't dovetail all that well. But they've no. obviously stood the test of time, haven't they? Yeah, a lot of glue. <laughs> yeah. Did you get good marks for that? No, no, I didn't. I didn't ever get good marks at school really? in anything. When did you? Um, when did you actually sort of find that you had some academic talent then? Sorry. Um, I didn't find any academic talent really until geography A level. Um, mm. I like geography. But you got as far as A level, so yeah, yeah. obviously some desire yes. to stay on. And, and then uh, and then obviously going, as I've alluded to previously, Sparshall and learning about fish because then I thought this is all right. Um, kind of made more sense. But then you, but, but you, not only that, you went on and pursued yeah. academia even further. Yeah, so, did a master's. And then ended up lecturing. So. Yeah. Well, once it, if you're doing something, like, I think any, anything in your life, if you can do something you're passionate about, it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and uh, yeah. Oh, it's funny that when you're young, history just doesn't, for me, when I was young, history just, I'd, I'd rather have put size four wide gates in my eye sockets. Um, than, but now? Yeah, but now I'm interested. Because the other thing is, you get older, you kind of appreciate where things have come from more, don't you? Mm. History becomes more important. Well, as someone who's really passionate about carp fishing history um i just love to see it all documented and it's one thing that i did want to really cover as well is um and we touched on it earlier is the yately stuff I, i'm not i'm sh not sure that i've ever seen uh, you talk in print about the time you spent on the car park <laughs> um, that's because it didn't go very well Rich. well <laughs> i did get a couple <laughs> yeah and uh, but i think it bears uh, a bit more detail because you know yeah apart from anything else i'm not sure that i expected you to go there and yet and yet you went there i did i did have a little flurry at the car park like yeah i did, I, I couldn't really not as i lived in hampshire and it was only 40 minutes up the road um but i the first the first encounter i had at the car park like i was chasing malins at raysbury and um i'd been on the fish's case for a few days and um i felt like i was getting quite close to catching it and um, it, for those you know watching it, Malins was the, this beautiful chestnut carp that I really set out to go and catch at, at Raysbury and was the fish I was like that focused on catching. And um, I'd been on its case. I felt I was getting close. I kind of got a handle on how it was moving around. It was in the North Lake. The weather was good. It was looking good for a bite and I'd moved three times and I, I, I got on the fish again and then I, I, the night happened and nothing nothing happened through the night and uh, the next morning I had a feeling I knew where it had gone and sure enough found it there now to cut a long story short I got myself in a stalking situation with the fish and um, I put some bait in fish had come in on the spot and I, I'd got I lowered a rig on the spot and it was just the most perfect stalking scenario i I'd, I'd cleared previously either side of the spot so i felt confident of catching landing the fish and i lowered the rig in and this 40 odd pound mirror turns around sees the rig or hook bait sucks it up and it was facing me and i could see the bottom lip go and i thought you're on and it come up in the water pecks back paddling and as it rose in the water, I stepped into the lake and I had a well-oiled routine of what I was going to do in this swim. And I just, the the bank was a bit mossy and it got a bit slippery and I slipped and the rod just went whack up into the trees above me. And it got tanked, the line got tangled in the branches above me. And as, oh, I hate this story because I can see it like it was yesterday. This fish is right in front of me. So I'm there on my back in the margins. The fish is right there like I could touch it. And this is the fish I most wanted to catch in the world. And its mouth's going, and the line is going straight up into the tree above me, and it's caught around the tip ring, and it's caught around the twigs. And this fish does a couple of big head kicks, and then the, the, it snapped, and the line's just hanging. And I and I watched it did this head kick, and then another one, and the, it snapped it, and it backed off, and it just shot off. And I was just like, oh. to lose any fish is rubbish. To lose the fish you desperately, desperately want to catch more than any other in the world at that point is double time rubbish. But then the, for me as an angler, the absolute most gut-wrenching, stomach-turning moment is realising that you've actually left some tackle in the fish. I hate that. I, I, it's my 
ultimate worst thing. I, I can't I can't get over that. When it, whenever it's happened, I hate I hate that moment. I think that's the worst bit of fishing. And I, this fish just powered off with a rig hanging out of its mouth. I, could, I knew where it had snapped. I could see exactly where it snapped. And I thought, well, it's only a short rig, but it's still a hook in that poor fish's mouth. And I, I just, oh. So I went back to Winchester because that was the, the one I was desperate to catch. And I just, if I remember right, I might have had a couple of beers. And <laughs> uh, then about 24 hours afterwards, I recovered enough to think, well, I need to go fishing. So I'm... Uh, where shall I go? Because I can't, there's no point in going to Raysbury because the poor old, I've just lost the fish. I was so upset about it. I couldn't get it out of my head, that image of it being right there in front of me. It's one thing when you have a hook pull or they snap you up 50 yards out, you've got no idea, but it was just like there. I could see it. Can I ask, so did it, when it was next caught, was that you or was that someone else? No, it, it was fine. The rig was gone and it was yeah. fine. Yeah. Just how does that, how John, they do John that? Holt was the next captain. Yeah. And uh, I remember saying, oh, John, so chuffed you caught it. Yeah, how was that? Uh, perfect and look fantastic yeah. how they do it just, yeah. they're just good aren't they yeah they're just they're just good at what yeah. they do so you um so yeah i i, I, well, I thought i might uh well i know i'll go to the car park lake so um i drove up to the car park lake and yeah in terms of carp fishing stories this is a short one because i got to the car park lake and I set off with a bucket because that i thought was the right thing to do and i walked round the car park uh along the, the riverbank side and I went round and I went into a swim which had this long uh, wooden walkway going out into it with reeds either side and I thought yeah this is a good vantage point and I sort of stood there and I always found the car park lake quite an intimidating place because it is a bit like a sort of football stadium of carp fishing everyone's kind of looking in on everybody else and I sort of stood there on this pontoon and I put my bucket down and I'm looking out and there about 50 yards out there are just carp cruising along doing what carp do and uh i'm looking at them thinking right okay if i was anywhere else in the world i would just go and get my tackle and have a go at them and i would probably have a go at them with a zig rig so i went i sort of casually as best casually i could sprinted like usain bolt round to the uh, more like forrest gump round to the van car got my tackle out the back and i went back to the swim and I went past a guy and his, I think his name was Simon, the trawler man. And he'd been at Horton and done very, very well. And I went, he was in the swim, in the first swim before Trumpton's. Uh, and I sort of passed the time of day with him very quickly. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. How's it going? And I said, oh, I'm going to go in next door. And I, I got back there and the fish were still cruising around in this center area. And I thought, well, even with my inept casting, I can hit that target. And I thought, I wonder how deep the water is out there. So I, I thought, well, I'll just... <laughs> Really, really simple stuff. I put on a fluorescent pink pop-up because that's the best bait for zig rig fishing. <laughs> Not, but I put it on. Tied, I tied off a six foot hook link on a two ounce lead and I just cast it out. And it went out and the lead went splash and then the boilie sat on the surface and I thought, it's too deep. Reeled it back in quick as I could and I cut off six inches and I cast it back out there. And this time the lead went in plop and then the pop-up lands on the surface for a split second and gone. And I thought, perfect. It's just gone under the surface. Perfect. I tightened up the line and I put it down on the boards of Trumptons. So at this point, I have been cast out for probably less than a minute. And I'm stood there and I'm watching around. And I'm feeling really self-conscious because this is the car park. And as I said, it's like everyone's watching from their bivvies all the way around. You know, there's a lot of this going on. Everyone's staring out. What's he doing? Who's he? Who's he? <laughs> and... Um, and I'm watching and I could see these three carp bow waving, just cruising, but like creating a bit of a bow wave as they came around. And I thought that that has landed absolutely on the money. They are going to go straight through that bait. And uh, I'm thinking, well, this, this looks promising. I thought if this has been in my local club water, I thought I'm going to get a bite now. But I'm thinking this is the car park. Like. And literally I watched these three fish cruising and the middle one just, the back just dipped and then there was just <laughs> on the surface and this rod on the boards which was on its back with a real handle face down which is going and it's running off and i'm thinking i've, I've hooked him i've hooked one <laughs> i'm thinking i haven't been cast out for more than two minutes at this point and so i pick the rod up and it hoops over and the other two fish are bolted at this point i'm thinking i'm now playing a car part lake fish and uh the enormity of the moment hit me so hard. You know? Oh my God. And uh, played this fish. And 
uh, of course, I hadn't got a landing net set up, and I, I, ha I had nothing set up at all, <laughs> literally. And uh, I sort of went, "Excuse me, mate. Excuse me." And uh, there's this sort of what? I went, um, "I've got one on." He went, "What? <laughs> I've, I've got one on." And uh, he comes into the swim, and uh, he, he <laughs> it's like, "What are you doing?" I said, "I've, I've got one on." And he went, oh my God, that's amazing. Uh, right, brilliant. So I, I, I need my landing net. So we got a landing net. We went out in the boat and we're playing this thing. And yeah, it went from weed bed to weed bed. And uh, having played lots of fish at Raysbury at that point, I, as soon as I'm in the boat, I thought, oh, that's fine. I've, I've got this routine. And um, yeah, I got, got above this fish. And um, yeah, it went round and round and round a bit. And eventually this ball of weed and carp came up and he scooped it up and it was pearly tail. And um, <laughs> thinking... That's insane. <laughs> so we went back to the bank and um, yeah, there it was, Pearly Tail. So I had a couple more beers that night yeah. to celebrate. <laughs> what, how was that received? Because obviously uh, people don't turn up to the car park. Well, it was, a, it was a fluke, obviously, but it, it was, yeah, just amazing good fortune. But it was it was just a funny moment. I remember Steve Pagalatas was in the swim at the other end and he looked out and he went, didn't even know you were here. <laughs> so it was really cool. It was funny because... At Raysbury, ph photographing the fish was often just you on your own with one person or doing self takes, and all of a sudden there's like this you know gang of people and everyone's got their cameras. Mm. I think from memory it was spawned out, but I think it was thirty two or thirty three pound, but it was a car park lake fish. It, mm. was, it was amazing. And from memory, you d did you knit, did you come close to Heather on a zig as well? Oh, don't Rich, that that's one of those moments that still slightly haunts me. There's a moment in December at Burfield which I struggled to get out of my mind, and that moment. Yeah, that was in in March, and I'd been in, I was in Trumptons doing more normal fishing on the bottom, and there was no one in uh, the swims on the um, bank um, beside uh, the lake, uh, the Pads Lake, and that side down that side, mm. which is often the swims that were very busy. And um, while I was sitting there, I saw a fish show, and I thought that looked like a carp, and I thought oh, I'm not sure, but I thought well I'll just I'll just reel in and I just take my bucket and I just go for a walk around there. and I walk around and I climbed up one of the trees and it's one of the most popular swims on the lake and I had my glasses on I say March cold March morning but the sun was out and I could see carp cruising up and down and familiar thinking, story hmm? a familiar story this one and I thought they're here they're literally right here against the bank so I thought right so I I, I put my bucket down and I tried to casually walk back around to my swim, trying to look sort of like, you know, a bit launch and yeah, just going for a cool walk around the car park late, man. Absolutely flagged around, threw all my stuff together, pushed my barrow back as quickly as I could, got into the swim and I tied up two zig rigs and I remember tying them up, like hands shaking and just flicking them out. And I just flicked them out on one ounce running leads, which is a mistake, but they went out okay. And I put like, put them quite close together and I got up the tree and I could see both bits of yellow and I got up the tree and I watched for about an hour, I don't know, half an hour went past and I remember the pineapple which was a heavily scaled smaller fish went right up literally went right up to them and one of them and stopped and then just turned and went away I was like oh not as close and then unmistakably the shape of Heather came through the swim and she she went up to it was the right hand rod of the pairs they sat on the floor and I, I, was, I was looking down like that and Heather went right up to it. Her mouth went, the foam disappeared. And like, it's just like time stops for a split second. And I look down and I'm up a tree and the line on the right hand rod goes like that. It twitches because I only had a one ounce running lead on. I finally had had a four ounce <laughs> lead on. It twitched a couple of times and I see her mouth go like that. And then she went and blew and out came the rig. And she oh. just cruised off. Oh, oh, I just think if only I'd had a house brick on the end, so it was you close. Would have been a wouldn't you? You'd have been I would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I probably would have had a six foot, seven foot zig rig on, but it was close. I, I don't think there could have been many oh. zig chances at the car park. I could be totally wrong. I don't, I'm sure that. Well, uh, Ben Hamilton had, uh, he was doing a lot of that sort of fishing. Chodder nostering. Chod, that's the one. Yeah. I did, I did catch Chunky as well. Yeah. I was hoping you were going to talk to me about I'm that. I'm going but... to tell you about Chunky. So <laughs> Chunky was the same thing. It's funny. And I, 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 it seemed that there was so much angling pressure on the bottom of that lake all the time that it was difficult to get it right. And and I thought that 
for me, the fish were cruising about all the time doing stuff. So that seemed to be the best thing to do was to attack them wherever they were rather mm. than wait for them to come to the bottom. And um, I was on that riverbank side again and I got on a, a swim that was looked good and I, I climbed the trees and I was watching these fish cruise. They were cruising down these like corridors in the weed that were probably about two foot wide, but it wasn't wasn't clear to the bottom. So you could see like the weed had sort of collapsed and there were like these roots through the weed, like roads. And you could follow the fish and you could say, well, that that's chunky and that's probably pearly tail. And they would do the same old route over and over and over through the weed. And you, you know, over the course of an hour or two up the tree, you could see it's going on and on and on. So I thought, right, well, there's no point in trying to find a clear spot on the bottom in those channels because it, it's like five foot deep weed. Uh, so I, I thought, well, I'd try and fish in in the weed channels for them. So I had to, <laughs> I devised a setup which was involved about probably about that much fifty pound line. And what I did is I had um, I think it was an ESP um, lead clip system, and it involved you putting a pin through the eye of the swivel. Do you remember mm -hmm. the ones yeah, I yeah. mean? Still do them, I think. Yep. So I pushed my fifty pound line through that hole. So I've got, I've got a bar effectively going through the, the so lead about, clip. What's five or six inches of that? Yeah, so oh, yeah. about, yeah, for those listening rather than looking. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, about five or six inches. So that was running at 90 degrees to my fishing line. And then I tied uh, a, another, um, a bit of 12 pound nylon, probably a, a two foot section of that, a reasonably long hair. And then I put on that two pieces um, of, um, buoyant plastic and I put them so they weren't touching each other so I put one on the knot and then I had a big loop of nylon and one at the top so they were separated by about an inch and a half because I thought well then if I th those carp were swimming around that world they're seeing stuff all the time on the on the on the table that the, 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 mm -hmm. the bait zones mm -hmm. I thought but it, I, I can't be the only person that's terrible with a catapult or a spawn there must be bait laid about in the weed all the time that they're eating that's safe so I I, I thought right so I'm going to I'm going to cast this out. It's going to land in that little corridor in the weed. My 50 pound nylon is going to break my little one ounce lead. It's full and it's going to sit up on that weed. And then hopefully with a two foot piece of nylon, it'll just rest out. There's two bits of plastic. It'll just sit there. It'll boom down nicely. And then it'll just be sat there in that corridor. And as the fish comes along, it's going to go, there's two grains of corn. I'm going to just hoover that up. So I got a catapult and I just literally catapulted out maybe seven or eight grains, probably seven. Seven, yeah. Uh, seven into the channel and then I, I tied up this very bizarre looking rig and I put a bit of loads of um, foam nuggets around the hook and I waded down to the edge and I got myself in a really awkward position and, and I literally was one of those really awkward no room to bring the rod back I flicked it forward and it landed absolutely perfectly in this little channel in the weed so in the, in the gap like that so I, I, I waded back to the rod rest, put the rod down, and I quickly climbed back up the tree. And I was delighted with the, the fluke of the cast, but it right. landed completely perfectly in this corridor in the weed. And what's more, at the point of when I got up the tree, the rig was sitting straight upright like a zig rig. And as I watched from the tree, the two bits of foam popped off. And this just interesting ever so slowly settled back down in that weed and it just it went out perfectly you could see the like the nylon just laid it out and i could actually see in the sunlight the two grains of plastic corn from up the tree and i thought oh my god i've actually managed to cast out successfully and it all looks pretty perfect from up the tree anyway went back down to the rod got set up got everything organized had a glass of water probably, got back up the tree, because of course then the curiosity was getting, uh, itchy, you mentioned my itchy feet, I said, well, I need to mm. see what's going on. So I went back up the tree and 10 minutes passed, nothing, so back down the tree, you know, tinker around, put broadly up or something, back up the tree again. And I get up the tree and I'm up the top of this tree and I see this couple of carp coming along this corridor in the weed and they're just following the same old patrol route I'd seen them take several times previously. And as I'm watching them, the lead fish, which look really quite big, 40 something pound big, is coming along. And as, as it got to a junction, in like a T junction in the weed, I'm thinking, go right, go right, go right. Oh yes, it's going right, it's going right. And it just turned and it came down, which is the same route it had used the time before. It came down and it was facing towards me. 
and I can, it's like I'm just watching it happening now on slow motion. This fish is swimming down this corridor in the weed. Massive, great, you know, it's a 40 pound fish swimming down a little corridor in the weed. And it's only in a, a sort of the channel is two foot deep. And it's cruising along very slowly. And all of a sudden you could just see the body language change. And it went, oh, there's a bit of sweet corn. And it just, just dip, slowly went down as it was cruising. It must've seen it from two foot before. It, it dropped down and it just <laughs> up went the two grains of flour. I literally like slow motion. I'm up the tree and I just see them disappear in. It righted itself and then its lip went and I could see the, the, the <laughs> corn coming out of its lip and it, it sucked and blew, sucked and blew and then it twisted and then it started to turn and as it turned, there's a did, did and then it's gone, it's facing back up the path in the weed and then it's suddenly dee -lee 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 -lee, and I'm thinking, fish on. I shot down the tree, picked the rod up and everything tightened up and it went solid into the weed. Now, at, at Yately at that point, I don't know what the rules are now, but there, you were allowed to go out in a boat to, to land weeded fish, but you had to go with somebody else that had to be, I think it had to be a bailiff, if I remember rightly, and the, and the boat was locked up around the corner. Well, that was all great, except there was nobody else there. And um, so I'm, I'm attached to this fish and there's no question I'm attached to one of the big Yately fish, 100%. I'd seen it as clear as day, but there was no one. So I sort of made a few helps. <laughs> no one showed up. So I, I rung Yately Angling Centre and said, I know that I, I've got a carp on and it's weeded me up. And I got the, um, are you sure it's a carp? There's, you know, a fair few people have been weeded up with tench. So I said, 100%, I know it's a carp. I know it's chunky. I've, I'm weeded up with chunky. Trying to remain calm. <laughs> I got chunky. Oh, get someone here quick. And and no, there was no one, you know, oh, okay, okay. And eventually a, a bailiff turned up and he paddled up in the boat. By this point, I, I'm figuring like 20 minutes, a half an hour had passed and we get in the boat. And, he, and I think there's a bit of conversation about whether it was definitely a carp. It's, like, it's definitely a carp. Yes, it's definitely a carp. Row. And we went out and yeah, this eventually got rid of all these bulls of weed. And um, yeah, this fish is coming up and the lead came out of the water. This tiny little one ounce lead that I'd clipped on. It hadn't popped off. It was so small. And this chap says, oh, mate, I think it's come off. But of course I knew I had like a long moon link. I went, I don't, and the rod's knocking. And I think, I don't think it has. <laughs> anyway, and we netted it up and yeah it was 44 pounds chunky <laughs> it was incredible and i remember there's that uh, thinking ah oh, yeah those fish from the car pot lake were very very special mm. uh, can you just we'll probably we will almost certainly run a photo of this um for the youtube version but for the podcast side can you tell us a little bit about what that fish looked like um, uh, Chunky, <laughs> chunky by name, chunky by nature. A big solid mirror with a big shoulder to it. Um, had a few scales on it. It was just, yeah, it was an epic carp. It, yeah, it was a beautiful, beautiful fish. Not, not like a, what you would say the quintessential Yately. It wasn't like carp. leathery. It was, no, yeah. no. Well, it was leathery, but but it was almost a. It was like a per, very perfect looking carp. Yeah, it was a beautiful, beautiful mirror. A uh, very, very muscular sort of. Yeah, shape really, and... really solid. Uh, the shoulders, you know, that you can see how they came up with the name Chunky for it. It's, it's just, it was all there. It's it looks so... quite a young fish. So yeah, compared really, to some really of those clean older, looking yeah. fish. Perhaps, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it didn't come out as much. I'm not sure, uh, but they were all well looked after. They weren't. Yeah, they? yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. But I'm interested in your um, inspirations around Yately because you've been on Raysbury, obviously widely seen as the pinnacle of UK carp fishing. Yately's a different ball game, mm. right up there as well. But like you say, that intense uh, crucible of kind of carp. Oh, it was. Yeah, really. Uh, Sorry. What really. made you go there? I, I think I just felt I had to try and catch a few of those fish because they were such history carp. Mm. And uh, as we've alluded to already in this podcast, that they're, they're, they're not about in the same way now. There are there's some lovely fish around, don't get me wrong. And it's not to belittle any of the fish that are in the scene today because they're magnificent and fantastic. And we all go fishing for different reasons. But I lived in, in Hampshire those fish were at Yately in Hampshire so they, and they were 40 minutes up the road and to have not had caught a couple would have been a, a crying shame. I wish I'd caught more, you know, I, it's time though, isn't it? Yes. And I did have a bit more, I did try a bit harder. I never managed to catch one off the bomb. <laughs> how, how long, how, how many sort of trips did you actually make? Do you I think, probably had 10, 10 trips there. 
I mean, that's not bad. To, oh, well, no, I'll Overall, take yeah. <laughs> including the Pearly Tale. Co- yeah, yeah. Ten, I, two original, two Yeah, mirrors. I did a little bit in January and February, which is when I uh, had my Heather running. I mean, you ta- you've got to ta- say oh, you're no, happy with that. I was one. very happy, yeah. And uh, yeah, to have caught Pearly Tale and to have caught Chunky are two very cool cars. I indeed. mean, the fact you were so in and out there is, is why you're not associated with Yately really at all. I think it'd be a surprise to some people that you even went there. Yeah. Because... You were blinking, blinking to miss it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just lucky on the right day, but it was well. No, because that that certainly the chunky capture is absolutely out of the box. Yeah. You know, in the same way that Ben's captures are on the Chodonoster. Yeah, time, well, I think he caught Oster. chunk as well. So it's interesting to think that that fish probably wasn't getting caught much off the bottom because it had learned to eat food up in the up in the weed. Yeah, and that that three dimensional thinking that you've indulged in there, because I'd have been one of the guys fishing the known spots with the tiger nut. You know. Yeah. But it's so leg. fascinating. The one thing that struck me there so much was when you went in any swim, there were people saying, oh, you need to fish at uh, 14 wraps and it, or 18 wraps and it, it, you've got to fish the little hump. That's where Heather comes from. And everything that I've learned in carp fishing is if you can do something that's outside the box, you catch more. And the very, very, very best carp anglers I ever meet are, are, are superb at doing that. Mm. And, you know... You know, I, 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 if I take anything from their skills and their lessons in life and fishing, it, it would be doing trying to be a bit different. And for me, when you see a fish cruising down a channel in the wheel like that, you've got to try and go for it where it is. And it, that, took, it took it. That is the, the the crucial thing, isn't it? That you were you were able to um, fish where they were. Yeah. Uh, in a way that probably most people would have considered them to be unattainable. You know, yeah. We're not going to be able to fish for these because they're not on the bottom. No, no. And, and all of your bites and chances came to rigs that weren't on the bottom. Yeah. I mean, that can't have happened. There was, I went back the, after Pearly Tail, the very next week, I walked into the swim just round from Trumpton's and there was a there was a very well-known angler in there fishing with a, a, a six-foot zig rig with a pink pop-up on. Okay. And that made me smile. <laughs> yeah. Was that waiting man's, right? Just round yeah. to the left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I made me smile. I see him yeah. cast out a lot. Oh, okay, so we'll have to try something a bit more out of the box next time. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It was funny. <laughs> in- incredible, incredible fish and and very much part of that, you know, I mentioned earlier yeah. about this idea that the scene is now different. Yeah, I'd love to have caught Heather. I'd love to have caught the dustbin. They're both very, they were yes. very cool. Um, these small families of carp mm. in, in, in hard pits, I think we touched on earlier how that, you know, very much doesn't, exist anymore because mm. we don't engineer waters in a certain way now we we make waters to what we think are, are going to be mm. uh the requirements of most carp anglers and that doesn't include stocking a chocolate box mixture of 10 carp into a lake anymore does it no which for us you know i grew up on that stuff yeah i know you were the same like yeah, you know yeah, definitely. like the the, the 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 kind of raspberry um sort of i would say like the the ingredients that were needed to make a raspberry yeah don't happen anymore. Because- well, it was believed, certainly twenty five years ago, you know, that to to get big carp, you needed sparsely stocked big pits. You know, that was the sort of the the the, the methodology of growing forty pounders. But do you think that anyone was even thinking about growing big carp then? I, I think so because there were people stocking definitely back then that were thinking, well, if I put twenty five fish in this fifty acre pit, they've mm. got a good shout of getting really big. But I think what we hadn't had then was the sort of um, I mean, the first time I went netting at, at uh, Linear Fisheries and uh, with I went with Sean then and I think we were, we were letting Oxleys. I think Sean and I were both completely blown away. We, we pulled this huge, I think it was 150 metre seine net where they took a group of students from Sparshot College up there. And o- Oxleys was in its heyday. I mean, it's obviously very successful again now, but back then there was a lot of fish in there. There are lots of big fish. And Sean and I pulled that net through. I, I just... I still remember looking at him thinking our eyes were on stalks. I've never seen so many big carp mm. in one net mm. all together and thinking, how can there be this many biggins in one lake? But of course, so many guys going, putting so much bait in it. It was, it was creating big fish in a different route, wasn't it really? Is there any chance that, that, you know, by being really successful with VS, you've made the sort of pool of waters that you would like to fish smaller in the country? I, I guess so. Well, I never, I guess so. I know you're not, you're not representative of, of probably 95% of carp anglers. Yeah. And, and and they do find um, what they need in those yeah. sort of lakes. But I mean, ultimately you're not telling people how to use the fish you, that you, no. um, you breed, are no. you? No. So do you, do they, do they actually go out in small numbers side? You, yeah. We have of, guys order five doubles. Yeah. But, so. uh, but 
to go to a place where the, the stock level is relatively low often, by today's often standards. Club, often club waters. Clubs, obviously a, a, an angling club that has a big lake on its portfolio is not being, a, by the very nature of the angling club, is unlikely to go, right, we're going to spend 20 grand on fish for this lake. Mm. Uh, but so those are the sorts of places that we you yeah. send fish out. And actually you think, well, these could get really big because they're going into a 50 acre or 100 acre lake. It's run by a club. Mm. And those have a and chance. They get, I mean, how do you feel about catching your own carp 25 years down the line or whatever um, it might be? I, I, I regularly get invited to go fish for my own carp, and, um, which is lovely. But I, 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 don't, I don't like fishing for them when they're fresh off the farm. Mm. I feel like they've got to go out and live a bit before you catch them. Yeah. <laughs> is, there, is there an element? To catch a, catch a 15 pounder that left the farm last winter. Yeah. I, I Would think. you rather not know it was yours later down the line? Yeah, I think so almost. Just, it could be anything. I don't mind if it's 45 pound. No. Probably. What's the biggest <laughs> VS carp you've ever caught? Uh, oh, be a 30 pounder. Oh God, I, that's a good question. I'm trying to think 30 odd. I don't know. I'm not actually sure. Mm. 30, 25. I mean, 30. there's plenty of time, isn't there? Yeah, I'll catch them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, actually a good example that I'm aware of recently, um, we've been doing a little bit, we're making a film for topography about Dorchester Lake. Right. Um, and I know that they've had some of your fish mm. uh, along with others, but it, they're a club and principally they want uh, their lake to still be a tench lake, you know, because the club was always um, run as a mixed fishery. I right. mean, obviously it had a very small stock of incredibly unique fish. Um, but since those fish have died, they've decided they take the decision to restock. Mm. Uh, and, and their, their fisheries officer was very keen to make the point that, it was actually tench anglers who kind of kept the club afloat when they when they lost the fish in, to a mix of circum, you know otters and mm. an old age, uh, but so they wanted to reflect the fact that that it's a mixed fishery and they they've stuck with tench but they've also put in I think eighty yeah um, oh, a nice car nice number they, well they started with I think fifty or sixty and and the lads who had tickets were finding it patchy <laughs> which it would be so yeah. so they upped it to eighty and I think it's not a big lake yeah but there's plenty of uh, interesting habitat for them in there to, yeah. to lose themselves in the carp. So, um, yeah, a good example of somewhere that, albeit not low stock by our standards, yeah. a club has decided that they're not going to fill it with carp. Yeah, um, yeah certainly Viv, Viv's taken truckloads of carp to, to club waters where he's put them in and come back and gone, wow, they're going to do really well. Yeah. Do you know, it, it, it kind of puts me in mind, of uh, one of my best mates is uh, and works for the Environment Agency, and for a long time he was surveying rivers and, and we could never really understand how he f forgot so much about where the, all the chub lived and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like you'd write a book, you'd write it down under such a bush, yeah. like there's yeah. loads of chub or barbel big, or whatever. Big chub here with a yeah. cross. <laughs> but it's a bit like you with the fisheries, like you've stocked so many now. Yeah, well, also, I'm, I'm, I add, Viv tends to do most of the deliveries. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm... Viv gets to see the, the the places they go into. So if far someone more gets if someone gets you and Sue on a delivery, they're either really lucky or or, or really or like, unlucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but or I tell you what, you stopped last winter. I, I Sue and I did a delivery to the railway lake, famous Johnson's yep. railway. Lake. Oh my god, that was a that was a huge moment. I I that was I I stood there with with Sue uh, and we we're unloading the truck, and yeah, putting those fish in there. That was a that mm. felt. That felt really solid. I thought, my God, I read I read articles about this. I read about chapters about it in books when I was a youngster, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And now we're putting some of our cart back in. That was a great moment. I I'm thought. thinking there must have been mailing, um, the mailing stuff. Yeah, it was, yeah. Which which is segues quite nicely because I seem to remember he caught Chunky off the top from, did, from yeah. the car park lake. Yeah. Um, was it was was that was it, those writings were an influence yeah yeah oh clearly. yes i loved all that stuff yeah, yeah. i mean uh, rob rob Malin's books were they were just they were when that was at that point where i i was in my carp fishing the bubble that is carp fishing that as a young lad you're drinking beer chasing girls and going carp fishing and 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 those are the those are your three facets of life. Mm. Really? I mean, it's not a bad life, is no, it? No, <laughs> but it, it, life gets it. You, you know, yeah. sooner or later, more complicated. Yeah, yeah, life becomes a bit more complicated. But yeah, drinking beer, chasing girls, go kart fishing, go kart fishing, go kart fishing, and then literally the moment you're not chasing girls, you're thinking about your next kart fishing trip, making bait, rolling boilies. I mean, just someone take me back. Oh, that'd be like 
Yeah, but you have the stuff now. Yeah, <laughs> of, course. of course. I wouldn't have my vegetable patch. No. <laughs> God so. I yeah. love my vegetables. Um, can we go back uh, a little bit to those days uh, uh, around, is it East Sussex or West Sussex? West Sussex, West yeah. Sussex. And, and we're talking the days of the ponytail, Si. Oh so if you've God. seen pictures of Simon with a ponytail, this is the kind of era we're talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, that was, quite, that was my hardcore era. So was that, was that when you kind of stepped up as an angler? Uh, stepped up. <laughs> I never think I had, never, never really stepped up as an angler. Uh, but that was the point where I think I started to get, m I, I was becoming more and more into the carp scene. And I remember that the pits at Chichester, I remember walking around with John Rose in the closed season. And we went on to um, uh, a lake there called Wick, and it was crystal clear. I had so uh, Chichester sits at the base of the South Downs, and you've got the South Downs, big area of chalk. Uh, so water, rain lands on the South Downs, percolates through, and it comes out through Chichester. It's just, just beautiful, crystal clear gravel, gravelly water. And you've got these gravel pits that are dug out, and they were full of clear water. And I remember walking because I, where I grew up in West Sussex, um, it was more clay ponds. And so the water was always chopped. It's mm. always the colour mm. of chicken soup. You couldn't really see a great deal. So to to walk around Chichester and see crystal clear water was quite an eye opener. And I remember John and I standing there in the corner of Wick, and John Rose had a bag of floaters, and he's throwing these floaters out, and these twenty pounders were just pack manning along. And now I, I don't think I had a quarter twenty pound at that time. My eyes were on stalks. It was like oh my god, it was like a like it was like a koi pond but there were all these huge carp swimming around it's amazing to see and there was this old dead tree in the corner you could stand on and go out on and you could look down and they were all around you and i remember thinking oh this is amazing look at that look how clear it is look how clear the war is oh my god you can see the bottom in 15 foot and there's 20 pounders crew i mean that was like mm. wow mm. so I, at that point i had as you've rightly said a ponytail and i was working in um, limington for McAllister australian partners and there was a lake over the road from Wick, which is on the Chichester and District Angling Society ticket. And it, there was this lake there called Vinitro. It's quite a famous lake now. It's called producing huge fish. But beside Vinitro was a lot less intimidating little lake called the Boating Lake. It was also crystal clear. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm ready to go mix it up with the big boys. There's some serious guys bivvied up around Vinitro. Um, so I thought, well, I'll have a go at fishing on, on the Boating Lake. And... This lake was a crazy place because it was it was a small, reasonably three or four acre triangle. At m I forget the size exactly, so forgive me if anybody's listening to this going, no, it isn't, it's one and a half acres, but <laughs> I remember it being three or four. And um, I fished it with Ben and there was some fringe lily down one side and then the whole of the bottom of the lake was covered in the thickest blanket weed you've ever seen. I've never seen anything like it. The whole bed of the lake was like four foot deep in thick blanket weed. And then all the way around was this gravel margin. Anyway, I, I, I sort of positioned a bait just on the back of this patch of fringe lily. And on, on the second day of our trip, um, it, it, I had a, a bite and it was a 14 pound fully scaled. And I believe that fish then got, subsequently got moved into the Vinitro mainland and became a proper monster. But anyway, that's another story. But Ben and I had a little dabble on there and then Ben headed off. And I thought, right, I'm gonna keep fishing this because I loved it. It was so clear, so, so clear. And there was all this weed and there was where the model boat club used it. It was like a circus. There was boys everywhere. There was little floating pieces of polystyrene made to look like castles and lighthouses. And there were all these things, boys everywhere. It was chaos. Uh, but there were these sort of 15 or so fish living in there. And I thought, well, I'd quite like to try and catch some of these. So I, I was at that point using uh, the inline um, leads. I was using a big four ounce lead, inline lead and uh, short hook links and what i was doing i was cooking up particles and then because i'd found this lake was not only was it full of blanket weed and boys but also eels there were eels everywhere in there so if you put anything that smelt remotely tasty in there the eels would eat it so the only bait i could see that would work was was particle and then t i don't know why because i felt this would help but i put my particles i my stole was probably a bit strong but i I did event, I've still got it now, but I borrowed off my mother, uh, like a Moulinex food blender. And so I cooked my particles and then uh, while they were still hot, I put them in a the blender and then blitzed them. So they ended up like this porridge slop. And uh, 
So what I was doing was I drive from Limington round to Chichester, which took about 40 minutes. And I, when I was working at Limington, I had to wear a shirt and a tie and was very sensible looking because it was a proper posh consultancy job. And um, I'd then drive to Chichester and I'd get out my shirt and tie and I'd, I'd had a, an old washing up top, uh, and a, like a shampoo bottle with a piece of uh, foam in the bottom. And I used to dab my porridge mixture on the spot because I was only fishing around the edges, surprisingly, mm. you know. So I'd mm -hmm. dab that. It would flutter down and create this lovely sort of alpen porridgey mixture on the bottom. And then I'd place a balanced tiger nut absolutely on top of it. And um, yeah, I had two or three fish like that. And it was, it was all very exciting. And then, yeah, there was a big one in there that I reckon looked like a 30 pounder. I'd never caught a 30 pounder at that point. But um, yeah, I, did, I got set up. And I remember the night I, I, I parked up where the remote com control boat club guys used to park their cars. And I got out of my car and I did the usual thing. And I, there was a little spot or two in the edge that looked a bit worked. So I, I put my rig in and put some porridgey slop over the top. And in the early hours, I had a bite and I landed this fish and it was this just big round mirror. And when I weighed it, it was 30 pound, two ounces. Amazing. That was uh, your first 30. That was my first 30. I was so excited. And so at about four o'clock in the morning, I, I went, to, I found a phone box and I rung my mate, Alan Black. <laughs> His mother answered the phone and she said, hello. And uh, I went, hi, it's Simon. I've caught a 30 pounder, is Alan away? And she was a bit like, it's the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, so I, she got him up and we had a conversation about it. And then I went back to the swim and I, I got some pictures done. <laughs> Alan came down. No, he yeah. didn't. Oh. But <laughs> I oh, just no. rang him up to tell him. <laughs> Like you do. Well, you were still bursting with. Oh my god, I was excited. And then I had to get into my shirt and tie, and then drive forty-five minutes to work. And then I had to sit and pretend to be really grown up and sensible and try and do maths on which I was hopeless at on a computer, which I was also helpless at use, hopeless at using, and try and function correctly. Far too overexcited. Have you um, your enthusiasm got? More or less, so over the because you are pretty, <laughs> it bubbles away under the surface, doesn't oh, it? Oh, but those it? moments you're catching a first day, no, 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 <laughs> but yes, were you even were you even madder back then, though? For it, oh, pro well, that was pretty exciting, yeah. I was living going back to what we say, I was absolutely living and breathing it then. And I think you know, it got to the weekend, and then there'd be a bit of girls and beer, and then back to fishing. So that was kind of like, we, we was just like a there was just a bachelor pad in Limington at the time, or uh, uh, yes, yes, <laughs> something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah. But a fruitful time, no doubt, so on yeah. both fronts. Oh, on all fronts, yes. Lots of good headaches. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that that fish, did it, was it one that, that... I don't know what happened to that fish. No. I don't know. I, I, I remember, I wrote about it in Cartworld. I think I called the article Eels, Boats, Boys and Madmen or something like mm. that. And uh, yeah, it was a cool place to fish. What about what about the old... Uh, well, the, old, the old Scotty rig was it? Was it the embryonic Simon's got rig? Uh, no, then? that would have been that, that. That was definitely at that point the very basic version of what the same as what we're using. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Literally, that, it hasn't. I mean, that yeah, was liner, what, It would have been line a line. Thirty years ago. Yeah, and that was with the, the, a, a heavy tiger nut and a, and a cork drill one. I think though, I remember talking to Lee Jackson in the tackle box. I would have been quite a young guy then, and I, I must have been. I don't know, in my early, early 20s, but I knew who Lee Jackson was. He was like, you know, mm. major, major celebrity. Caught 40 pounders. Yeah, yeah he was a proper, yeah. proper angler. And uh, I remember going in the tackle box. I remember initially being a bit like, oh my God, look at this tackle shop. I'd never been in a tackle shop like mm. it. You know, that, that just, the kit was, just the walls were just covered in carp gear. My local tackle shop where I used to go never had any bit carp. Sea fishing gear. stuff. And, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a bit like that. Yeah, crab lines. Yeah, yeah. so um, I was a bit blown away. And then I, I, I chat, th th there's this guy who I knew exactly who he was. Um, and I, I said, Oh, if you're fishing over tiger nuts, do, do you, do you, um, I can't remember quite how I worded the question, but it would have been very clunky. Uh, I thought, you know, how, how do you, and he said, oh, you can just use a piece of cork made to look like a tiger nut made, that'd be fine. So I think at that point, I was probably using a bottom bait tiger nut and then a piece of cork, which mm. I trimmed down to look like a tiger oh. nut. And then I used to keep that inner pot of tiger nut juice so it smelt right. I mean, that still works today, so it I would It still works today. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of your fishing on it, uh, in around that area, yeah. did, did you... Did well, you... then after... So after the boating late... Um, trying to think it's quite a few years ago now rich um well we think it might be th do you think it might be 30 years we ago? think it might be 30 well, years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a lot 30 odd years more um yeah it would be 30 odd years ago so we then went over to wick and i remember 
John and I had a spell on Wick that was truly, truly magical fishing because we went over there. Now, John Rose at that point was working at Duncton Mill Trout Farm, which meant he had access to pellet, lots of pellet. Mm -hmm. Now, we we went we had an idea that we thought pellet might work well at wick i mean it, this is a long time ago and people have done i'm sure turned it over much bigger and better than we have we did then but we went to we went to wick i remember the two swims we got set up in and we we were in these two swims and the weed had sort of died it was late summer at this point and the weed had it had sort of the beds had collapsed and were drifting a bit and there was just they were all carpeted in blanket weed they had that sort of real thick blanket weed scum over them and a f probably a few like ye yellow willow leaves where the willows were beginning to drop like dusted over the surface and the weed beds had sort of come in and you were fishing in these little channels between the weed but you have cast between them it would go thump down so it was to the bottom but you were sort of in these gullies so we we got us, I was to the right of John, he was to my left, and we, we catapulted Pellet in. And the reaction was absolutely biblical. I, rem, I just remember thinking, oh my, there was fizzing coming up and twitches and, and then more fizzing. And you're thinking, they really, really like Pellet. And I, so I remember John had two sacks of it in his car, so <laughs> we had quite a bit. And um, we would catapult a bit more and then the fizzing would stop, but we it would start again. And But you couldn't, getting the bites over pellet was tricky. Really interesting one. It makes you think back to people fishing a PVA bag of pellet and a white pop-up. But you'd, you'd catapult out and fizzing would start. And after 10 or 15 minutes, it would slow down again and stop, no bite. You think they are definitely, definitely coming in on the rigs. And I guess we were probably using boilies at that point, just fished on the top of it. Well, it evolved quite quickly. Uh, so we worked out that you could get a bite if you used like a balance bait, something over the pellet that they were hoovering up as a bite same time at yeah. the same time. And I ended up using a rig, which which for me was pretty high tech, but it was it was um, Maxima line, and I think it was three point two breaking strain, and I think I was using four or five lengths of that. So I used to cut the lengths to the same. You know the sort of thing I mean. So you use it, it's like yes, multi-strand like multi nylon, yeah. Yeah. and uh, so you'd get the nylon. You tie a knot, and you get you could with practice you could get them so that you could tie that rig so that they all run in parallel with each other. The, the length. So you used to used to make it wet all the time. I got quite good at it, and then you tie it off, and then you put a hair on the back of the hook. And the beautiful thing about that was when it was in the water, the strands had open out and they became invisible. And then we we worked out that fishing a tiny pop up trimmed down would just sink matching the pellet. Oh my God. It was it went from struggling and why can't we get bites to carnage. We were we caught we caught low I I mean at that point I'd caught like one or two twenties and a thirty pounder and all of a sudden we were catching five twenties each in, in two days. It was it's, and lots of doubles. It was very, very exciting. And were you out every weekend so like that? Pretty point? much, yeah. Every every spare minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was very, we did I think we did four or five trips onto Wick. And we, we caught lots, I, you know, I, I still got in my slide folders, I've still got pages and pages of 20 pounders and 17 pounders. They, I mean, they all seem big then. It was brilliant fun. We, how often do you sort of browse back through your old stuff? Sorry. Oh, quite occasionally. I like that. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Particularly as I'm getting older, it, <laughs> it reminds you where you were once. Um, but yeah, it's nice to look back through pictures like that. It's one of the things you lose, I think, with the, the digital mm. memory that we have now it's it's that, that physicality of looking back through pictures and holding up a slide file you know you get a piece of a4 plastic with the slides put in it 24 slides in it and you hold it up to the light and there's all those little images of the past um so uh, yeah good to do that but yeah so we we did the sort of four or five uh trips to to wick but we had i remember the guy to john's left chucking into our coming across and then we were getting increasingly stressed by that so we decided we would we would go over and fish churchyard which was kind of where i was always heading so that at that point there was this lake called churchyard on the chichester ticket and still there today and we knew that the biggest fish in west sussex lived in churchyard and uh and i and i wanted to try and fish there and it was because it was a much more a lightly stocked lake, uh, perceived to be that much harder. Um, it was quiet. So we went for a couple of walks around there and that's where I met um, uh, Steve Whittington and also uh, Steve Larkham, Hampshire Graham's brother. Uh, and uh, although I don't speak to Steve very, very, very infrequently, uh, still a good friend. And um, we walked around there and I, I thought, oh, this this is quite cool. It was quiet, there were some swims, but they were quiet. and. 
that, that you know that, that there's obviously this really big fish living in there and so we went over there and the virtually the first trip we went john caught a 32 pounder out there and we were like oh happy to that have been a pb for john yeah time? i think it yeah. was yeah and i thought they eat pellet they eat pellet um and then yeah and then that was that and i remember alan black my mate who i mentioned earlier on he came and did a, a night on there and we actually fished on wick he came and did a, a guest trip and because wick had lots of fishing i said come and have a go on wick i can get you you know we'll get a guest ticket so we fished wick and it was a real stormy wintry session and I've got a photo somewhere of Alan wearing bright red skiing salopettes in a bivy like that, 45 mm -hmm. degrees. It was pretty rough and ri pretty rough old stuff. Mm. Anyway, so I think for the second night, I said, Alan, why don't we just go and fish a night on Churchyard? Because it's such a cool place. And we got set up and I was sitting in Alan's swim having a, a, a takeaway and some beers. And Alan just had this drop back where the bobbin just went like that. And he sort of went, oh, I wonder what's happened there. I went, Alan, reel in, strike, reel in and strike. And he still went, uh, you reckon? And I remember him picking the rod up, reeling in, reeling in, reeling in. And then it went like that. And then he went, like struck and it all came back, nothing on it. I was like, Alan, this is a serious carp lake. Yeah. That was a take. And uh, and then I remember he had the bluntest hook on I've ever seen. <laughs> and he was like, it wasn't a proper carp, mate. Because if it had been, I would have hooked it. I was like, oh, I think that was a carp. Yeah. Anyway, and then I, and then the next, yeah, that, that was the autumn, winter time. And then, as I say, uh, John had caught one and then we caught another one. And then we then that was my start of my first sort of season on, on Churchyard, which was, yeah, very exciting, very difficult fishing for me at that point. It wasn't easy. Vis visual fish, visual fishing? Uh, yeah, they were, but not, I think the sort of maximum range of fishing was probably 50 yards or so. So nice casting distances. Um, but fishing for, I think, effectively at that point, there were 12 fish in seven or eight Amazing, acres. Yeah. yeah, so it's quite hard going. Uh, and I and I did struggle to start with. Uh, I literally caught a couple my first season. So the pellet approach wasn't the, the panacea just, that you'd hoped. No, it just didn't seem to be working there. It just didn't. It didn't work. I did catch a couple. I caught a little common on it. Um, I remember, but I saw Steve Larkham catch the big one at forty something. Um, yeah, so it was it was a, it was a great. But and it just wasn't many people there. Wick was always busy next door. Occasionally we'd drop onto Wick if a swim was empty and catch a twenty pounder. Just to reassure yourself that I you would, still catch yeah. them, yeah. and then you go back onto Churchyard. But the, my second season on there, it, it, I don't know how or why, I went back round on myself. But I I thought I'll I'll try sweet corn, and um, I don't know what led me to think to try sweet corn, but I tried it. And I think the the problem was it was the bait was coming back smelling really strongly of the lake. It it was tainted. It was tainting very badly from the sediment or the rotting weed. It was a very eutrophic, very rich lake. And you'd reel in your boilie and you just you'd smell it, and it didn't smell of boilie. It smelled of rotten weed. And I thought it just the mm. bait is tainting, and the, and the same was happening with drill pellet. It just didn't come back smelling horrible. And uh, so I I thought well I'll, I'll try sweet corn, and um, yeah, literally, <laughs> the first time I tried sweet corn, I got a bite and I thought, what was I doing last season? You know, like 30 or 40 nights for three bites, two or three bites. And now suddenly I'm two nights in and I've caught one on sweet corn and then another one and then another one. And I was, I had, obviously you learn a lot, then you're on time on a lake, you start to suss things out. And I I was getting more confident at spotting, like look, you'd, you'd climb a tree, which you climb 10 or 15 times in the last 10 or 15 weeks and look over an area and suddenly you think, there's a little yellow spot that wasn't there before. And then you put a rig on it, 20 grains of sweet corn, 21 grains of sweet corn and it would go. And you think that's beginning to work. And then that season, I remember, um, <laughs> things had changed. I'm not sure this would happen today or my parents would have been had up, but my mum and dad, um, they went away on holiday, I think, to Corfu. Now, my mum was very, very house proud. So she she locked me out of the house. <laughs> she knew, so. I she locked you. me out yeah. of the house. And um, so I had to, <laughs> I had to, <laughs> I was sleeping in an old summer house shed <laughs> on a bed chair. That was my home because I'd been locked out of the house. So they, I'm sure if you did that now, you'd be getting, your parents yeah. would be done for child abuse. Thing. But anyway, that was the way of the world. My mum was very, very house proud, love her to bits. So I, I was living in this summer house and um, with all my fishing gear around me. And, and um, I got, so unsurprisingly, I got terrible, terrible guts at some point along the line. And I was back down at Churchyard and I just had the most amazing upset stomach. 
and I was fishing on the causeway between Churchyard and Wick and I thought oh, I just need to reel in and go to the toilet block. And I, I, I remember feeling uh, that anybody listening to this at uh, an age will know the feeling when your stomach is doing absolute somersaults and you get that horrible, clammy, sweaty feeling. I thought, I need to be in that toilet block. So I reeled in real quick and shot around there. And I uh, yeah, sat there feeling awful. And I thought I probably should go home. I'm not feeling at all right. And I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just, the, the ship settled slightly. <laughs> so I walked back down and I walked back down from the toilet block and I sat in a little corner swim that was there. And while I'm sat there, I'm aware of this fish moving from left to right. And I'm, I'm sat just in this little swim and I watched this fish. I couldn't see which one it was, but it was bow waving along and it come round in front of me and it tipped and it went down on this gravel bar right in front of me, like 10 yards out. And I could see it and I thought, that is definitely the big one, 100% that's the big one. And I thought I probably ought to go home. But on the other hand, I, if I die in Chichester, is that so bad doing what I'm, I love doing? You know, to, to die of gut rot actually on the bank. Well, you'd be remembered for a few years mm. around Chichester. For, that was, oh, Simon Scott, he was the bloke that died of rotten guts in that swim. So I went and got my gear and I moved it around to the swim. And by this point, the sweet corn routine had become quite well oiled. So I, I flicked out my one ounce running lead. I'd made little uh, polystyrene lead protectors that my lead pushed into. They were very cute with sellotape around them. So I'd, I'd walk around with my nylon hook links and my, my three grains of, uh, of um, sweet corn. And I just flicked it out on that bar and I put 20 grains of sweet corn, 21 grains of sweet corn around it. And I did the same with a left hand rod to set up. And that evening, my mate Steve Larkham comes down and he set up around the corner uh, in the sort of back channel around to my right. And I said, Steve, I don't think I want to have any beers tonight, but the fi the big one's about. And uh, yeah, it was not dissimilar to the Nazi story. Nothing happened through the night. And at first light, the right hand rods did, did it. It was getting a few, there's a few twitches and I was like right on it. And um, did, did, did nothing. You couldn't see into the water because obviously it's first light in the morning, but there, there was a, there was that movement on the surface. Did did pick the rod up, long fight, and yeah, there it was. And it was 39-12. And I mean, that that's a giant. It, what year are we talking there, sir? Oh god. So <laughs> well, we're talking well, 30 odd years ago, aren't we? Yeah. So sort of So I was I was yeah, pre uh, like in the nineties, yeah, early nineties, yeah. yeah. That's a, an enormous, it was enormous an, it carp. It was an enormous, enormous fish. Yeah, and then, so I reeled in and Steve and I went and had breakfast in the roadside calf, which is still there today. And on the way over, we met uh, Mar a guy called Marcus who was fishing on Wick and he'd caught the biggest fish in Wick. And we went and had a celebratory, celebratory breakfast. Oh, you must together. have felt like Rob Malin. Oh, it was amazing. Did you have mushrooms? I probably did, yeah, yeah. I can't remember. And tea, but I remember being so excited. And then, uh, yeah, I went on to catch quite a few more. And that also at that time, I discovered ground bait working really well. And I went on to catch quite a lot more fish that season. Yeah. Sweet corn and ground bait. Like, oh. feels like not the sort of thing that you do though now. I know sweet, you've caught but, so many on sweet corn over yeah. the years. But but that but it's interesting, the ground bait. I, I, I'd i make balls of ground bait and I'd catapult them out with a whopper dropper. <laughs> you know, that, I don't think you could have done it on a busy lake because mm. it was it felt a bit embarrassing. All, social. That, all that yeah. noise. Yeah. Badoosh, 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 badoosh. Particularly, of course, being a terrible catapulter, they were going all over the place. But those carp love that combination of sweet corn. The other thing I discovered was that you could thread, this is before spawning uh, or spodding Long in my before, case, yeah. uh, but I was threading, um, I'd thread, I'd get my can of Piscaviva sweet corn, the tutti frutti orange one, and I'd thread that onto PVA tape, like 15 or 20 pieces. And I, I, I was clipped up and I cast out and it hit the clip and then go in. So you were leaving sweet corn lines all mm, over the mm, spot. Mm. And fishing over the top of that was great. Can I ask, when the, with the multiples of seven thing, does your hook bait have to be the twenty first or, or, or is no? It 20, it's, no, it's twenty one well, extra grains. Freebies, twenty one freebies is lucky. Right. Oh, was that a Mary thing as well? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty one or yeah, twenty one? No, it's twenty twenty one great. I remember. I remember counting those three out. <laughs> twenty one out. Of what about the red stuff, Si? The, the strawberry. Yeah, or was it tutti frutti? Yeah, it was the orange piscaviva sweet corn, which I then took after churchyard. I went to Burfield and from Burfield to Raysbury and that's, yeah, the same thing. Cause I, I remember at Raysbury thinking, just nobody uses sweet. I remember, well, the first time I walked around Raysbury, I, f I found Malins and 
I remember opening my can of pesca viva sweet corn and putting a little pinch in and it just the fish just dived on it and mm. he's like oh, the best bait i've ever eaten and it just mopped the whole lot up and i'm thinking i'm watching this going on thinking oh my god they really 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 like sweet corn and so i remember i remember when i first started at raysburg and i was catching a few trying to hide the sweet the sweet corn all the time i remember jim shelley walking along the path and i'd had to i had the can in my hand and i'd seen him coming and i'd had to jettison it into the brambles yep. and then i would had a conversation with jim and then i remember going back trying to get my can because it you know that each can was like a hundred pounds back then you know value to me because i had no money trying to get it back out of the brambles thinking who the hell threw this in here i mean if there's a tin in the bushes at a fishing lake generally it's a sweet corn tin, yeah. so it would have blended in perfectly yeah wouldn't it? it would have yeah, it aroused no suspicion Jim would have been far too sharp to spotted that <laughs> yeah. but not something you do so much now so i would tell sweet corn uh, no, just the, the way Burf. I, I did use sweet corn at Burfield, mm. uh, and I caught really well on it. Really, really well on it. Definitely, like um, big quantities or uh, all sorts. Yeah, I caught on on single little stacks of sweet corn mm. on a baited area that had been previously baited. But yeah, I found sweet corn worked really well there because you, quite often it was that trap for you, wasn't it? The the, vi the vis very visual trap of twenty one grains yeah. or seven grains. I or... just think it, it's not a it's not a a small pinch of sweet corn is not a fishing situation for a carp, is it? It doesn't come across a patch of, you know, a big patch of boilies. A carp that's been around the block a bit will come into that and think, okay, there's lots of lovely food here, but realistically there is going to be a nasty surprise somewhere on the table in front of me. When they mm. come across just a pinch of sweet corn, it's just like, it's almost a bit of a, it fell out the back of yeah, a like spawn or it? Yeah. Simon Scott tried yeah. to throw it out and it went all over the place. So <laughs> they just love sweet corn. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, you know, I'll go back to my favorite baits in the world ever in tiger nuts because of their resistance to other species, plus the fat carp love them. But I can't think I've ever come across a carp that didn't eat sweet corn. Mm. They just love it. I mean, I've just come back from the Ebro and, you know, bait up with maize, sweet corn on the hair, bang. <laughs> yeah, fish on. Brilliant fun. And it's been so good actually to, to hear that you've been back outside because I think those of us, you know, who speak to you a bit probably worry that you know this is a terminal i love your concern that i'm giving up <laughs> don't worry rich i'm still here so the but the autumn is like as we listen to this is yeah. likely to be on top yeah. of us so are you can we um you know can we assume that you might be dusting the rods uh, no i think i'm quite excited sort of september time to, but this to... you've already missed the period of the year when you are least busy uh, on the farm i'll have a little bit of time in september and early october so i shall uh yeah and a bit of just a bit of something that you fancy or any any particular plans are you going to disappear off to somewhere quiet? yeah somewhere quiet uh around maidenhead maybe okay <laughs> <laughs> you can't mention its name because you'll be no. banned <laughs> yeah. um well look thank you so much for coming in sign as That's ever been an it's absolute been, pleasure it's been wonderful to chat and um uh you know hopefully next time we see you it'll either be because you haven't done the slideshow and we can do the Burfield oh, common no. chat <laughs> that's just the biggest incentive to do a slideshow i know i know or uh, we can talk about some entirely different stuff so okay but thank you so much mate my Cheers, pleasure uh, thank you mate the thinking tackle podcast